Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the rest of you. We are back for another episode of Bitcoin Magazine Live. It is now your host, Q. I'm joined by my co-host, P. How are you doing, P? Fantastic. Doing great. How about yourself? We're enjoying life right now, man. Can't complain. Just rent-free in my mother's basement and stacking those cheap sats. And we also got our producer, Chris, on the line with us. Chris, how goes it? No fires to put out? No, not today. I think the stream's running, stream's running hot, but uh, no fire here. You love to see it. Love that. Love that. I mean, look, as of right now, Bitcoin, I'm going to triple check before I make these outlandish claims that Bitcoin is below 30K, but we are sitting at 29,646 per strike as of this moment. Uh, Bitcoin has not gone above 30K. And I think my first question to the two of you is, how much have you been buying? Have you backed the trucks up yet? Or are you still expecting cheaper sats to come? Look, I'm not going to lie to you. I, you know, did everything I could to back the truck up at, um, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to like, you know, 55, 60. I had to buy some at 69, obviously, because why the fuck not? Um, so I, I bought all the tops and I bought all the bottoms. So um, I have been sitting on a little bit of capital that I hadn't yet deployed. Well, rather, I still had some chairs that I was able to liquidate very quickly to a man that lives down in the street. I liquidated those chairs. I liquidated some of the uh, the friends and family that no longer, you know, were, were serving Bitcoin. Um, and then I used those that uh, those funds to purchase more Bitcoin. So the short answer is yes. Yes, Q, I have backed the truck all the way up through the back wall, and I'm just loading it up with Bitcoin. Now, will it go lower? Maybe. People are saying uh, probably, but I don't give two shits. I just want as much of it as I can get. And I've given up trying to predict exactly when we're going to hit that bottom. So I'm in. I'm all in. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't live in my mother's basement anymore. I used to. Um, so I have a bunch of bills that uh, came due. And uh, I guess you're considered leveraged long then. And I didn't want to put myself in an even worse situation. Uh, I do have a couple organs I can sell. Like, uh, I don't think you need a gallbladder, got an extra kidney. Um, so I guess maybe those can go next. But uh, in terms of fiat, I am broke. Uh, aside from what my uh, DCA is that's set up and just keeps rolling. Uh, but yeah, I am, uh, I'm all tapped out pretty much. Look, don't make me feel bad that I've just, you know, been saying for a while, I think it's going to go down. I've been telling Alex for some time now, hey, like, maybe we should have some dry powder just handy. Look, Alex was trolling me yesterday, but I'm going to move the goalposts live on air and say, look, a quick little test or dip all the way down to even like the 26K range that like when I woke up this morning and saw that I was like, I knew I shouldn't have gotten to sleep. I knew I should have just stayed up all night. But I still think 28K is valid. I still think 28K is a valid floor. You have a 5% threshold below and we're still within that range. You're not like seeing it like hang out down there. You and even if we do, then like we'll like elongate the time period that we're hanging out down there. I'm still look, treating 28K like it's a gold mine. Look, see, here's your mistake, man. I, I love you. I have the utmost respect for you, but you are still living in the fiat I can predict the future world. Bitcoin does what Bitcoin do, and we cannot predict what that's going to be. So, you know, for me, I say this as someone who used to be a degenerate uh, futures trader, right? I was like, I can see the patterns. I don't even see the code anymore. I just see blonde, brunette, red, you know, all that stuff. Uh, and I did, I did fine. I did well. Um, but I came to understand that I was just being, being, being lucky. And I think I am not particularly skilled and I won't claim to be. Um, I think you are a lot more skilled at the trading aspect than I am, but, uh, yeah, man, I just buy, buy early, buy often. And that's my strategy. When I see like the symbol, you know, also wait, we were talking about some of the, the, uh, the specific chart patterns yesterday and you were like, you know, quoting some of them, you know, uh, you know, head and shoulders and all that stuff. And I, for me, it's like the names alone are just fucking wild. Like I keep looking for like there to be like the hanging man shitting into a golden cup formation. And I feel like all the time, like people are just, you know, throwing these terms out there that like, I'm like, I don't even know if that's real. Like I used to study this shit. And like, is that a real, is that a real pattern? Like big flag, little flag, you know. We're coming out of the dead baby pattern. It looks like a, a cresting exactly. moon. <laughs> exactly. Like three testicle penis pattern. Like, what are we talking about here? A genuinely Japanese candlestick charting candlestick. Dude. 
dude, that looks like something you have uh, like next to your bed, if you know what I mean. Like, I have, I have the, like the first two volumes of this, and I'm telling you, like, this explains what a hanging man like formation is, and like the psycho the psychology behind like what sort of happened, and they equate it to like both like it, a lot of this was founded and formed during like futures rice tradings in the 1600s but a lot of it actually they equate back to like military um formations and patterns and strategy and it's fast it's all human psychology and I so think, that's yeah. why I, I wanted to present this question to you guys during the price action stuff i didn't want to say it during pre stuff i wanted you guys to genuinely think about this during the bull run in like 2017 we made an all-time high of like just shy of 20k like just about that range in each essentially bull run to bear run of bitcoin's entire life correct me if i'm wrong but you haven't seen a bull run then go to a bear run and have that bear run undercut the previous bull run with the exception of the first that didn't have a first bull run to work off of and so that that's great. why I'm, I'm having a really, really hard time buying this idea that Bitcoin is going to go below 20K, quite frankly. And so walk me through maybe why I'm a crazy astrologist and like full of absolute shit, or do I have like a valid rationale or conclusion in that? I mean, look, I can talk for days. Chris, do you want to jump in before I start going on a rant? Uh, I felt like I was like, uh, you know, in uh, Rain Man or in The Hangover when he starts doing the numbers. I feel like that's what you're talking about. But I'm like the gif of the dude or the woman who's like trying to count on their hand. And they can't figure out what, with what you're saying. So I'll, I'll toss it over to Pete to give more color commentary. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, what's that? There's an amazing Twitter account. It's like, uh, God, it's like out of context ads or something. And it's just like all like the weird B-roll that they use when it's like, like, you know, like, did your foot fall off? Are you dying of diabetes? Do you have like a colon that's only three times the size what it should be? And it's like all these people with like weird, crazy expressions, like Ugh, or like trying to pour pour milk in a bowl, and it just like goes everywhere, like all over their body, and they're like, Ugh. like that kind of thing. I feel like that's the the explanation you just gave, which is also how I feel um, around trying to predict exactly what the price is, or what the price is going to be, or what the floor is going to be. Like, bro, look, was I was I, you know, setting up, uh, you know, was I buying long calls uh, at, uh, you know, 30K, 40K, 50K? Maybe. Yes, that's that happened. Will Did I lose all the money that I put into those long calls? 100%. Um, so I look, who the fuck knows what's going to happen in the short term? I will admit 20K seems like a crazy low number. Part of that though is like, we understand what Bitcoin actually is. We understand that it is uh, unconfiscatable money it is the soundest money that has ever existed. You know, uh, just as a throw, as a callback, as a throwback, right? You had, you know, gold and precious metals and diamonds and stuff in the past, uh, which basically were fantastic in the past at transmitting value across time, but they were terrible at transmitting value across space, right? Gold is heavy as fuck, right? Uh, you have to pay constant costs for security, all that shit. Then paper money was fiat was, uh, well, actually there was you know paper backed by standard. That was a really important technological innovation because you know fiat tends to do a very, very good job of transmitting the value across space, right? You can carry, it's paper. It's literally one of the lightest materials that is easily produced. And so it transmits value across space very well, but it is terrible historically at transmitting value and just in reality across time. So you got gold, good at transmitting value across time, bad at transmitting value across space. Then you have paper money, fiat, great at transmitting value across space, terrible at transmitting value across time. And you have Bitcoin, which is like the, the next evolution of of a, a value storage, and it is fantastic at both things. We understand that. We get that Bitcoin is the future. And so for us, our views are necessarily warped. Also, we're in this magical bubble, right? We are surrounded. We intentionally surround ourselves by people who also understand this. So it's hard for me to kind of break out of the mirror hall, break out of the echo chamber and be like, what will the larger market do? Because the larger market is dumb as fuck. And I just, you know, my, my solution to that problem is, 
buy whenever I can, increase my income streams, uh, you know, sell my body to the night, move into a cardboard box under the bridge, uh, eat cat food, whatever it takes, I'll do it so that I can buy more Bitcoin because I know in my heart of hearts and deep in my nethers that eventually Bitcoin will be the ultimate store of value recognized universally. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely add on to what P said. You know, I'm a little bit, uh, I guess, cheaper than him. So I buy ramen noodles because I think they're like 10 cents a, a thing. I'm not sure if inflation has hit ramen noodles yet. But uh, yeah, that's my go-to right now, that, that fiat food that helps me stack more sats. I think it's a point that I, I made yesterday. And, and just to tie it in again, like if you're denominating your life or your balance sheet, your personal balance sheet, your business, whatever, in sats or in fractions of a Bitcoin, if you're getting more sats every day, you're doing better than you were the day before. We automatically default as Americans or the USD being the global reserve currency. We always assume, oh, Bitcoin's price went down. No, the, the price, if you stack more sats, you have more sats than you had yesterday. If you do a weekly buy, monthly buy, whatever it is, if you have more sats today than you did yesterday, you're doing better off from a Bitcoin standard point of view. If it's the scarcest asset we've ever seen, scarcer than real estate, scarcer than stocks, scarcer than bonds, scarcer than any of these different things, you're buying a piece for the future. Um, but we always love to default back to Bitcoin. Yes, the, the nominal USD price has gone down. But if you're stacking more, you're getting more sats poured per dollar that you buy today than you did yesterday when it was a higher price or the day before. You know, and I'm just saying on this small time frame, obviously, you know, we'll get to a point when a lot of Bitcoiners think that people won't be taking US dollars. And the way that they do that is for a historical reference, whenever currencies hyperinflate, it gets to a point when like it breaks that peg. And let's just say you're a farmer or you're uh, a gas station owner or whatever. You do not want the currency that does not pay your bills. So you say, I, like we go back to a traditional barter system. Uh, hopefully Bitcoin can bridge the gap that we don't have to do that. They say, I want to take Bitcoin. But like if they're giving you a wheelbarrow full of money that's more valuable to burn in your fireplace or use as toilet paper, that is not a good currency at that point in time. You're better off with doing something else, whether you're like, hey, I'll give you, you know, if you give me some beef, I'll give you some gas. And we always talk about how these other currencies don't work over time and space. You know, okay, like cattle, you know, that you need to refrigerate that. The beef can only last so long. But that's why Bitcoin, I know Greg Foss always says this, we're trying to build two parallel systems that like, you know, USD is your checking account that you use for your bills, whatever you need right now, you're kind of gaming the system. And then your Bitcoin is your savings account. That's for your future self. That's what you want long-term. It's also your investing account. It could be many different things. It's your self-sovereignty account. It's your privacy account, a whole bunch of different things. So that's what makes it a better store of value over time and space. Uh, I'll kick it over to Q now. Like where in the entire landscape of assets that are getting inflated are you guys more worried about now versus uh last week when the most recent cpi numbers came out i also don't believe that you can get 10 cent cup of noodles yeah we, we have a chat going in the background and chris is claiming that uh, oh no no these are not cup of noodles i am poor it's the the square ramen noodle like square blocks you know what I mean? I thought those are 25 cents. Oh, pfft. no, dude, where I am, I'll hook you up. I got a plug. Bro, you're breaking, you're, you're, you're fucking up my dream. I, I want to figure out an economic way to eat like dog food. I want to get like the, the dog food that's good enough for humans, right? Because dog food, apparently it's like grade F prison meat, right? Like if you're in prison, you're getting fed the shittiest meat there is, shittiest protein. But then a step below that is like dog food, not for human consumption, cat food, shit like that. There's got to be a way to get like dry kibble that I can just like scoop into my mouth hole in order to stack more sets. Um, I'm just saying. Like, why hasn't, uh, why is that not a Bitcoin product yet? Someone in the Bitcoin space needs to invent, like, do you want to stack all the sats? Well, then stop being a little bitch, stop eating those seed oils, you know, start calling canola oil rapeseed oil, which is what it's called, by the way. You guys know this, right? You yeah. know the canola oil scam, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, for the audience. Divulge, it's- divulge for the audience. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it was a dark and stormy night, and there was a type of, uh, there was a, uh, I don't even know if it's a grain. Basically, it is a, uh, it's the thing that quote unquote canola oil is produced from. I believe it's a type of grain. And it has always been called rapeseed oil. That's what it's called. It's called rapeseed. 
and uh, big canola oil decided they were like, well, rapeseed has the word rape in it, which has a negative connotation. So what if we change the name to something that is better? And then they were like, well, what can we change it to? And they were like, well, most of it is produced in Canada. It's Canadian. Canada, Canada, uh, canola oil. And that's how canola oil got its name. But its actual name is rapeseed oil. And so whenever I go into a store, whenever I go into a, uh, a, you know, a diner, I always ask that whatever I'm getting is fried in rapeseed oil, you know, hard R. And um, it never goes over well. I've been kicked out of multiple diners, multiple Walmarts. And I you know I have the Wikipedia page up, but nobody believes me. And it's one, this is one of the things that I'm, I think Bitcoin fixes. Um, you know, this world hunger, cancer, Ebola, that's the end of the list. Those are the things Bitcoin fixes. Just those things, nothing else. Nothing else. No global financial markets. Look, I mean, those are your words, not mine. Um, I just care about the children and Ebola. Stop giving them rapeseed oil. Do you yeah. think YouTube will take our channel down if we say rapeseed enough times? Almost certainly. Okay. Chris is already like cutting all this out. <laughs> I can see Chris sweating through the camera right now. Guys, I know, I know. It's stop. pretty glorious. I couldn't, I can't, I can't help it. I'm like a, like a dog chasing, uh, you know, the fucking mailman or whatever. All right. I'll stop I, saying, me, I'll stop saying the bad word. Let me present this question to you guys. Like, in Bitcoin, we talk a lot about like, you know, taking care of yourself. We see a nice movement for like wellness and, and knowing what you're putting in your body. I mean, we shamed Joe yesterday for drinking a bang energy drink on air as though it's like a viable nutrient source. So are these moments where like, we're willing to cave on that? Like, do you want to just say like, you know, fuck my body for the next 12 to 18 months so I can just stack so gloriously and like never have to worry about money again or is it more through the lens of hey still take care of your body still handle your, handle your shit or and then stack aggressively yeah i'll just jump in here um i i mean all joking aside i uh if you don't have your health you don't have anything and the idea that like, you know, I, I'm speaking tongue in cheek because there's a large contingent of people who are like, my body is a shit coin. Bitcoin fixes everything, which is what I was making reference to just a second ago. Bitcoin does fix a lot of shit, but it doesn't fix half the stuff that people are like, Bitcoin fixes, right? Like Bitcoin does not fix the, again, I, I'm obsessed with incentive systems and the way that incentives drive uh, human, not only human behavior, but I have a, a background in you know, neuroscience and behavioral ecology. And just all systems are incentives driven, right? You have all this different, you have all these different selection pressures that are that are selecting for behaviors that uh, drive towards a certain outcome. And I love Bitcoin so much because it aligns incentives in a way that I don't think anything else that has ever existed does. But Bitcoin doesn't fix everything. And if you buy a bunch of Bitcoin and you actually are living in a cardboard box under the bridge and you're eating cat food, like great, you might have like a... Uh, an incremental more amount of Bitcoin, but guess what? You're not going to have any fucking friends. And more than that, your body is going to hate you and you're going to die like five years early. So no, like find the balance, my friends. Do not like, uh, you know, sell your chairs. Cause yeah, sure. You can sit on like a folding chair, but, or whatever, or like a cardboard box or a milk crate, but like, no, do not go and uh, like, not like if you don't want to have a gym membership, cause it's expensive, like that's fine. But like, you can fucking go for a run, like go for a run, take care of your body. And take care of your friends and relationships. Like loneliness kills. Like have a community, do all that shit. Do not just be a be fucking Bitcoin dragon holding your Bitcoin and sitting on it and alone in the darkness because you'll fucking die like 10 years earlier. And then who the fuck cares how much Bitcoin you had? I started skipping lunch, but sure. You can go on a rant as though you're better than us, P. I'm also eating I'm fucking with you. So. You're absolutely right. I mean, like Look, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like educate the children. As you know, I'm the oldest person in this room right now, uh, the tender age of uh, 69. And I, I mean, I remember when you know price tickers for the stock market were coming out of those weird little machines with the bells on them, like the ding, 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 with like the glass bell jar. Um, but that's just in the movies, man. That's not real. 
that's what you think. That's what you think. All right, let's ground it back. What 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 is our next topic? Um, look, I don't want to. We're not trying to dunk on it. We're not trying to like beat a dead horse while it's down. But Tara continues to impress with how low it can go. Like if this was a limbo contest or we were playing golf, like Doquan, you crushed it. It's just we're not <laughs> playing those games. That is a quote for the ages. That if we're playing limbo, if we're trying to get as low as possible, Doquan, you fucking crushed it. Like, way to go, bro. Way to liquidate everyone. Way to pack your bags. Way to do the thing that everyone who's full of shit is doing, which is like, how can I extract as much Bitcoin as possible from the people who need it the most and put it directly into my pockets and also, you know, my genitals? That is 100% what Doquan is here for. Uh, fuck that guy. If you got wrecked, on this uh this Terra Luna trade, like you know, a lot of Bitcoiners loves to be like, oh shit, like fuck you, you know, like die in a fire. The reality is like we've all been there. Like I came to Bitcoin, uh, I used to trade uh equities, as I was saying earlier, like out my ass, trade futures contracts. I was like, I don't even know what I'm trading anymore. Fucking oats, wheat, soybeans, corn, lean hog futures. I don't give a shit. Like, I will stay up until three in the morning trying to like manipulate those markets and it's so cute to me that, you know, uh, past Philip thought that like he had a, a leg up on the hedge funds that are spending millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to, uh, to get that edge. But I was like, but I have it. I have it in my hands right now. I can, I can outthink them. I couldn't. Um, yeah, we've all been there. The point is take it on the chin, take it as a learning lesson, buy Bitcoin instead of these things that promise to make you rich overnight because if it sounds too good to be true it fucking is i'm curious pete how much like credence you give to this being like poor planning and poor leadership to go down this path versus you know putting a lot of faith in an algorithm to keep a stable coin in check and in turn like not necessarily pegging it to something a little bit more I hate to say it because it's Bitcoin, stable. You take that back. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think it's a good question. Um, I'm going to bring this back to Ethereum for a second. There is a, like, Bitcoin is truly a unique innovation. Bitcoin is trying to do one thing and kill it at that thing. And that is be sound money, be the soundest money that's ever existed. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. That is what everybody who's in the community, that is to say all the developers are laser focused on it. And we've seen these incredible threats to Bitcoin, right? There's the block, the block size wars. There's all these smaller in instances where Bitcoin, uh, people thought Bitcoin was going to fail. And when I say fail, what I mean is, fail in its primary objective. The narrative has shifted, right? Bitcoin was, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's changed over time, right? It was unconfiscatable money. It was, uh, I mean, it has always been that, but uh, it was an inflation hedge. It was uh, so many different things to so many different people. And the reality is all those narratives exist simultaneously. If you're in the US and you don't have to worry about the government or as much of the government, like coming in, beating down your door, stealing your value, uh, it's something else. If you live in Africa, then, uh, or in certain parts of Africa, Africa is a continent. I saw your face, Chris. Uh, you know, then there are parts where people are having very, they're, they're, they're using Bitcoin for very, very different reasons. Um, but all these other tokens are designed to do very different things. And separate from my own uh, constant derision of those other tokens, the thing that I hate the most is the, the kind of lies and obfuscation, right? I wouldn't give a shit if Vitalik was like, come on, guys, Ethereum is designed to, it, it's designed to be a, a pump and dump scheme, or it's designed to be this like radical experimentation platform where like we fuck stuff up all the time. You put some money in, maybe you have to pay 5K to get it out because of gas fees. Like who the fuck knows? Like if you want to like play fast and loose, like come over to the Ethereum land, but it's never presented that way. It's presented as like, this thing is a fait accompli, uh, you know, 
it's just like Bitcoin, but better. Like that narrative is so fucking infuriating. And I think that like Luna is uh, falling into that as well. And Tara, it's this whole thing where basically instead of it being like, this is a risky thing, this is a, uh, a get rich quick scheme. This is something that if you can time it correctly, you're going to do great. And 99.99999% of people are going to get totally fucked, right? Like no, no VC, no, no, no startup is going to tell you that those are the odds if we're talking about startup land and companies. But at least within like startup land, you understand that like you're investing in stocks, you're investing in a thing and like maybe it's going to succeed, maybe it's not. It's infuriating to me when things like Luna are presented as like, this is a done deal. You put your money in, there's an algorithm, it does the work and everything's easy. Like, that's not the way it works. We're seeing that in Bitcoin right now. The sound is funny. We're seeing like, I thought Bitcoin, like I, I would have told you six months ago, 12 months ago, like we'll never see 30K Bitcoin again. Like that was my, that was my view. And I was wrong. Bitcoin also has the pain that it creates, but at least to me, it is open and honest about those risks. Whereas things like Ethereum, things like this whole Lunaterra bullshit, um, they obfuscate what's actually going on in order to line the pockets of the people who get that pre mine, get those early super low rates. And that's the thing that I can't stand, that duplicitous nature. Yeah, I think that was a great rant. And I, I kind of like what you say, like with Ethereum, like if they were like, hey, we're, we're fast and loose, we do whatever, we move fast and break things, quite literally our own like blockchain. Like if they said that and you're like, hey, if you want to take any risk, go for it. But I agree. Like they're, and then even it's so disingenuous. They're like, people that like market for it are like, oh, this is um, ultra sound money or something like that or whatever. I'm like, you've got to be joking. Like, right. Like, like, like if you're like, Hey, just kidding. Like, that's not true at all. But like, no, they're absolutely serious about that. Or at least their marketing dollars are behind that or, you know, all these different things. It's just, it's completely absurd and very disingenuous. Uh, Q, anything else you want to add there or Pete? I was going to say like, to, to your point, again, you just got to look at the narratives. Like, Whatever Bitcoin is doing well at, whatever people are like, oh, wow, I understand Bitcoin's value. Ethereum, again, not to pick on Ethereum, but 100% to pick on Ethereum because it's the biggest, you know. They just changed the, the goalposts. It's like, oh, uh, that, like, I mean, you know, like we, we, we laugh about this, but like there was a time when it was like, Ethereum is the world computer, like decentralized applications, like it's going to be great. And then fucking, what was it? Crypto kitties like broke Ethereum and they were like, oh, just kidding. Now it's this other thing. Now it's this other thing. Now it's this other thing. And now we're talking about like a shift to proof of stake, which by the way, is never fucking going to happen. And then the, as you mentioned, ultrasound money, people were like, oh shit, inflation. I never had to think about that as, uh, you know, part of a first world country, but now I do because the government is trying to uh, steal everything that I have. And so- <laughs> People are like, oh, wow, Bitcoin does have value. And then Ethereum is like, but what if we were better? What if there was a thing called ultrasound money? And it's like, that's not even a term. It doesn't exist. But it's all bullshit. It's all just the shell game. Go ahead, Q. I'll stop talking. No, I, I think you guys bring up an ex excellent point in that like this idea that they're presenting these things as sounder money when in fact it's just conflated it's a marketing slogan for them and unfortunately there's no i'm not i realize i've continued to sort of pound this drum quite a bit and i'm not necessarily saying i'm pro regulatory action but like to then disclose or for someone to some entity to come out and say like hey these are securities based on these criteria that we deem them to be and then bitcoin is now considered an asset that separation, I think, would be massive. And you don't see as much pain as you see. You don't see as many people take a speculative uh, bet and you know risk their whole house or mortgage their home or risk their life savings on it, like some of the posts that we, we're seeing on Twitter. Um, and it's, it's a painful lesson. It's a lesson a lot of people have had to learn. But then it, I think, sets you down that path of answering the real question of what is money? And what are the properties of money that make it a sound, viable investment? Um, and I'm curious, like the two of you both bring up the idea and concept of sound money. What is that one property for each of you that's like, this is sort of that thing where it's, this is make or break. If it doesn't have this, it's not sound money. Um, I, I guess I'll start, I'll start with that first. Um, I mean, I think... And, and this, 
I hate to say it like this because like, I guess gold was considered a sound money historically over time, or at least over the last 5,000 years or so. And they always said that like, it's difficult to, uh, to obtain or get. And I guess we can say in the, at least the last hundred years, it looks like gold, uh, like the rate at which gold comes back into circulation or that they can mine it is about one and a half to 2%. Uh, I guess my thing is for the hardest money in the world is that there's a fixed supply of it. Like there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. I know that you can't, like you could say people have used other vehicles as a hard money, quote unquote, in, in history. But Bitcoin's the hardest in the sense that there's only ever going to be 21 million. I guess if that were to break, uh, obviously that breaks Bitcoin's whole consensus mechanism. It, it breaks the protocol. Uh, I don't believe that to happen. Uh, people have tried to do that. Uh, I think when people, it's kind of like what we're seeing right now with, with all these BIPs or Bitcoin improvement protocols that are trying to go through. Like if one of them really forced things to go in, it would fork off. I mean, we saw that with all the other cryptocurrencies that, are, that have come about after Bitcoin that, you know, like exactly to, to P's point, to tie it back in once again, they like copy Bitcoin's code and then they try and change things. Whether it's Litecoin, you know, forexing the supply, whether it's, uh, you know, all the other ones that are like, we're faster than Bitcoin, you know, we can do it faster, but Bitcoin has the lightning network. So like, Bitcoin, in a way, adopts to, I consider all these altcoins a good thing in the sense that they're test playgrounds for Bitcoin for great things for it to adopt. A lot of those things, 99% of them are stupid. It's kind of like VC land, you know, you know, for every one thing that hits 99 or even more than 99 companies die. Um, but if something really hits and really works in another protocol or whatever, Bitcoin's open source. And if the developers think it's, and, and the community thinks it's great for Bitcoin, they can adopt it and help improve it. But the, the core facet of Bitcoin that there's only ever going to be 21 million. And obviously we can see in the protocol, you know, 2140 is the last year that it, you can mine Bitcoin uh, and get a reward for it. Obviously then the network propagates off of the fees that cost to transact on the network. So then miners are fighting for quite literally the fees of people transacting on the blockchain. Kick it over to you. I think for me, again, it comes back to the incentives. Um, the reason that VCs, I said this a couple of days ago, but the reason that Ethereum became the thing that it, that it is, is because it allowed VCs to play the, the, the startup style games that they wanted to be able to play in a quote unquote cryptocurrency. And so to me, it's not even the 21 million, though that is something, again, everybody has the, their, their own different path to, to, to Bitcoin, right? With, you know, at Bitcoin 2022, it was really important to me to bring in some of these other like narratives, which is why I like, you know, I worked with HRF and Alex Gladstein to bring in a lot of these freedom fighters who were, uh, who were, who came to Bitcoin from a very fundamentally different perspective than I do as an American, right? For a lot of people, Bitcoin has always been, or the way that they came into Bitcoin is as uh, unconfiscatable money, right? We love to talk about that in America where all of us are based, but like, that's not an issue for us really. The government has not yet said like, uh, we're coming in, give us your Bitcoin or we're gonna kill you. Like that's not a thing you have to deal with or even, not even that. The government has not tried to like tax unrealized gains though it's fucking coming, take your money, take your Bitcoin off exchanges. Uh, so for me personally, my entrance to Bitcoin was, uh, as a, uh, based on inflation. I grew up, as I said the other day in a, in a household that was like gold bug style, right? Like, you know, uh, and, and coming into the job market in 2008 was an extremely, uh, powerful learning moment for me. So for me, the thing that I would like, you know, and, and, you know, I throw these figures out, you know, whatever it is, 80% of all us dollars that have ever existed have been printed since 2008. That's fucking crazy. For me, that is the most salient thing. That's the thing that would kind of got me into Bitcoin. Um, but for other people, it's different things. And I think that the thing that I would, that is the most important to me is the incentive structures. So it's not necessarily the 21 million, even though that is the thing that brought me into Bitcoin personally, it's that the incentives align and serving one's own interest, which is ultimately what we are all doing. Like anyone that's like, oh, it's all about the altruism. Like we're here for the feels, like we're here for, you know, uh, to help uh, the, 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 the starving children. The reality is at the end of the day, when the chips are down, 
we as humans will all do what is best for us as individuals and us and best for us in our smallest community. And the beauty of Bitcoin is that it aligns the incentives. In Bitcoin, doing what is best for you, doing what is best for your small community is also what is best for the larger network and everybody else. And that is a truly amazing thing. And if that were to ever change, if the incentives were to get uh, fucked up, that would be a red flag for me. I, but I just, I, I don't ever see that happening. We, we've, you know, Bitcoin has been forged in the most brutal fires that uh, have existed. I mean, the number of times that China, uh, India, all so many countries have tried to quote unquote ban Bitcoin, it's comical at this point, right? I remember so vividly the moment when uh, China for the first time, uh, you know, quote unquote, banned Bitcoin and the market's like tanked. And it was like, oh my God, Bitcoin is over. And you know what? Bitcoin wasn't fucking over. So there's going to be more challenges. There's going to be more issues that come up but because the incentives are, are correctly set up. Bitcoin will always thrive and succeed where nothing else can. That's my take. So I, I will say this, I agree with Chris and the idea of scarcity for what is really the driver of soundest money. Um, but so that we could have a variety of answers. I think something else, I'm going to just steal it from you, Chris, that you alluded to, it's the difficulty to create or obtain said monies. Like everyone who's read the Bitcoin standard knows the story of like that old tribe that had the rocks that had to be like taken in, in a very ceremonious way. They had to be carved out. It wasn't that it, you could get a new stone almost every day or every week. There was a lot of labor, love and care essentially that went into creating this money for this community or how much mining effort it takes to mine gold or Bitcoin. And then how easy it is to just mint US dollars as simple as pressing enter on the copy machine at the Federal Reserve or you know, entering a couple of buttons into a document for a loan at your local bank. And all of a sudden you've just introduced new money to the environment. So I think that idea of how difficult it is to create coincides with the absolute scarcity and why Bitcoin is the soundest money. But any, any final thoughts before we move on? Cool. Uh, I just want to also remind everyone that tickets to Bitcoin 2023 are on sale right now. They are cheaper now than they have ever been or will be. Uh, I don't think we'll ever have tickets this cheap again, probably like forever, forever, ever. And ever, ever, um, buy them now. You're going to have to travel wherever we put it. It may or may not be in the same city. It might be somewhere else. All we, all we will say is it will be in America. So buy your tickets. Come on down. Come join us. P, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin 23? Yeah, man. I mean, I think we... Uh... Bitcoin 2021 was the first of its kind. It was absolutely amazing. We outdid ourselves with Bitcoin 2022. Of course, I am focused on the programming because uh, selfishly, that was the thing that I uh, you know, put all my effort into. The programming was amazing for Bitcoin 2021. It was even better for Bitcoin 2022. It's going to be even better for Bitcoin 2023. Uh, the, the, every aspect of the conference though um, improves more and more every year. And I feel like one of the things, you know, I, I've worked for a lot of startups and there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of kind of hand-waving and bold claims made. Um, and the thing that I love about being part of this organization and working with you guys and everybody else is that like, we actually stand behind our claims. And, um, you know, David Bailey, our CEO, has had significant opportunities to um, exit in ways that would be like totally understandable. And he has instead like tripled down on building the largest conference, the conference that supports bringing as many people into Bitcoin as possible. 
as, as rapidly as possible per unit of time. And I just see that commitment again and again and again. And so uh, I have never worked for a company that I'm more bullish on, and I have never uh, known of a conference that I'm more bullish on. So 2023 is going to be even more incredible than 2022. And um, let's fucking go. Yeah, I agree. I think it was, uh, I mean, this is my first conference to uh, go to for at least the Bitcoin conference. I've been to other smaller conferences, but uh, to be on the other side and hosting it, I mean, uh, it's like an, a small army hosting a, a large event. And uh, to P's point, I think, you know, we do kind of feel like a startup at times, you know, we, we are, uh, I, we're a small company for sure. And like, to your point, like David Bailey had an opportunity to leave a couple times and uh, you, to, like, to your point, he could be set and not have to worry about money or, or Bitcoin or whatever again. And he's, this is his mission to uh, hyper Bitcoinize the world and bring adoption, show how important it is for not just us in the United States and how privileged we are. Uh, also go check out, check your financial privilege by Alex Latzin in the Bitcoin magazine store. What light chill there, but um, no, but honestly bringing Bitcoin and how it's great for the world, listening to even, and, and P you can talk on this. Uh, I was busy running around and watching all the different stages, but like, um, the one that really stuck out was Gladstein's panel talking about how, you know, check your financial privilege basically is what the name of it is and bringing in people from all different walks of life around the world and saying how Bitcoin helps their situation, whether they're in Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, um, in Africa and various places around the world that like, you know, we're really privileged to have the global reserve currency be the United States or the US dollar here in the United States um, and just how Bitcoin helps people that are much less for- fortunate. And I, I think caveat tying it back into cryptocurrencies being disingenuous and they're kind of rug pulls. Like a lot of people say, Bitcoin's not fast enough. And I would say for the scale that we want to go globally, that's true. But the Lightning Network offers that for people around the world. Like if the base layer were to get too expensive and become like the Western Union, I would kind of say like Bitcoin's failed in that way. But with the Lightning Network, a lot of people around the world are able to use it for payments much, much cheaper. They don't have to put themselves at risk for gangs going to like a bank that they necessarily have to take a bus three hours to go to a Western Union to get money. And, you know, Western Union or the the banks alike scalp a lot, large portion of it. They can send small uh, payments to their colleagues uh, or family back home uh, cheap, easily and quickly. So I think that's just my two cents. One thing I would jump in on, I want to push back on the idea that higher on-chain fees would mean that Bitcoin has failed. Like to me, again, the incentives are like, are, are successfully aligned. So people have to talk about like, you know, people use the term mining, um, really, as Michael Saylor likes to say, uh, quote unquote, miners are actually, they're like security nodes. They're being paid by the network. They're incentivized to make sure that it is economically infeasible to attack the Bitcoin network. And they are succeeding wildly at that. The network is succeeding wildly. So, you know, to me, when we talk about like the, you know, on- increased on-chain fees, uh, <laughs> people loved to say, and I'll just say it, fucking idiots still love to claim like, you can't buy a coffee with Bitcoin. And the answer is like, that's 100% false. There is an entire country who has declared Bitcoin as legal tender. You can 100% buy a, a coffee with Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, which is a layer two solution. And layer two solutions are basically, you have Bitcoin, which is sound money, and uh, everything is laser focused on uh creating a system where that is, it is economically infeasible to, um, to cheat or lie in that, within that, that, uh, that, that system. And then you have these layer two solutions like lightning and there's other ones as well that basically have trade-offs where they basically, uh, you know, require slightly more trust. And then the, the trade-off is you get essentially instantaneous transactions at almost zero fees, which is what, you know, tools like Strike, Jack Mahler's company use, and so many others. So, um, and I think we're going to continue to see that. We're going to continue to see these uh, additional tools, additional systems built on top of Bitcoin. And once you have that rock solid foundation of, uh, you know, this immutable money, you can do all sorts of stuff. But again, to use the analogy that I was using yesterday, it's like, but when you're in a system, when you're in a fiat-based system where the uh, the core measurement 
is being changed secretly. And you're, you're being told like, oh no, this hasn't changed. Like don't even trip dog. But the reality is it's like, you're trying to build a house, you're a contractor. And then every night the fed comes in and they just change the, the length of one foot. And you can imagine the house is going to be in fucking shambles. It's never going to work. That's the world we live in. And that's the world that Bitcoin fixes uh, as a direct contradiction to the thing I said earlier. I said that Bitcoin only fixed Ebola, uh, world hunger and a couple other things. But the reality is it, uh, it fixes a lot more. Don't tell anyone I said that. I'm trusting the two of you, the only people on this call. Anyway, so make sure you get your tickets coming to Bitcoin 23. <laughs> Buy your tickets. <laughs> no, you won't be disappointed. Come to Bitcoin Disneyland. That is all. <laughs> you, like, I'm at a loss right now for just what happened based on what we were trying to talk about. But sure, let's go over to the Havening because we're now two years out from the next Havening. Um, and essentially, like in layman's terms, that happening is a four-year cycle set up, uh, pre-coded in, I believe, to allow the block rewards to cut in half during each of these four-year cycles. So the first four years of Bitcoin, the block rewards that miners would receive was 50 Bitcoins down to 25, and it's currently down to 6.25. And the next block, uh, the next happening in two years, will take the block reward down to the, to 3.125, right? ish something like that so Correct. um look a lot of people attribute four-year cycles to the happenings themselves a lot of people have now been claiming that hey the four-year cycle is dead um just initial thoughts on the happening and what impact it has had previously and what impact you guys think it can have in the future p i'll give you the mic again yes all right um so yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the narrative has been that basically Bitcoin, the value or the, the fiat value of Bitcoin tracks on where we are in the four-year cycles. There's all sorts of charts. There's like the rainbow chart, which is actually originally created kind of satirically, but um, the, the way the Bitcoin ecosystem works is there are multiple like sort of groups of participants there's the miners or the security nodes who are incentivized by the network and we all pay them with our transaction fees um, in order to uh, make sure the network is secure then there's like users who are basically transacting in bitcoin and then there's like devs who are developing the bitcoin protocol and uh the as the incentives change the economic calculations, the arbitrage opportunity, sorry, as they change based on the block reward, uh, the economic incentives change and then people behave differently. And so what has historically happened is people have invested capital in miners uh, leading into the happening cycle. And then uh, people tend to uh, unload towards like the top of the happening miners who have been accumulating all this Bitcoin uh, and that tends to drive the price down, um, which is a you know predictable action. However, as more and more and more market participants have come into Bitcoin, as people have been using Bitcoin more and more for other uses, um, as we talked about in terms of you know uh, um, store of value, uh, unconfiscable money, uh, you know more private transactions, all that stuff, uh, it has kind of clouded that that environment. And so, um, I do think that the idea of a four-year halving cycle is ultimately, I don't want to say dead, but has been thoroughly kind of uh, debunked. We're in this, we've been trading sideways for like 18 months. And a lot of that is because these larger central uh, centralized financial entities are actively trying to attack Bitcoin right now. Um, there's all these ex uh, sort of exogenous factors that are contributing to the perceived value of Bitcoin. Of course, the three of us know that one Bitcoin is always worth one Bitcoin and, uh, you know, kind of live our lives on that basis. But I think that the idea of a four-year cycle is it is still one of the largest, if not the largest influence on the, uh, the Bitcoin price, you know, month to month, quarter to quarter. But I think that we're seeing that uh, change as these larger as more and more people sort of buy into bitcoin and entire nation states do yeah i think uh it's it's interesting it's part of the whole protocol you know the difficulty adjustment the way that it works um i will caveat one thing i guess uh just to to clarify 
the halvening happens every 210 blocks, which is about every four years, but it's probably closer to three years and 10 months. So just to give people like, oh, you said it was four months. It's like, not exactly. It's, you know, blocks are supposed to come in every 10, 10 minutes, but they don't always, sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. And obviously the difficulty adjustments always trying to keep it in uh, homeostasis, like in that 10 minute window, window with um, changing the difficulty, but uh, just something to note. Um, and I, I agree with P. I think it's kind of, I, I haven't been in Bitcoin since, you know, 2009 when it started, but obviously everyone has this like thesis of like, oh, it's four year events. You know, we ride up, we, we go past, we blow off top and then we crash down and then we have to accumulate down at this lower range and we have to go all the way up, blow off top, crash down. I think that's kind of debunked. I mean, everyone knows it's been going on for 13 years now. What is it? Yeah, the protocol has been running for 13 years. Everyone knows what's going to happen, but to exactly P's point, the miners don't know what's going to happen. So if you're all of a sudden you're going to get half the amount of Bitcoin rewarded going into the next happening, you're trying to dump Bitcoin to get fiat cash to make sure that if things go haywire or it collapses or breaks, you want the cash to be able to cover your costs for electricity, for, for cost of miners, for any loans that you may have. But then ultimately the reward is obviously cut in half for the number of Bitcoins you're rewarded every you know 10 minutes for winning them that... Um, it's just becomes a scarcity mindset again. There's there's less Bitcoin going into the ecosystem. So in time, as people, retail, um, investors in general, uh, banks, whatever, corporations, as they accumulate this free Bitcoin that's now on the market, um, there's less and less of it to buy and less and less miners to sell them um, back into the market. There's about 900 Bitcoin that are added every day. Another way that I like thinking of it is uh, once we go through the next happening, there's only be 450 Bitcoins added to the market per day. And that keeps getting squeezed smaller and smaller, which is really fascinating. And obviously we'll get to a point when uh, I know CK and Dylan LeClaire always bring up this point, like 30K sats will be generational wealth in like 108 years when the block rewards only 37 sats is what it'll be. Uh, it might outlive PQ and, he PQ and I here. But um, it's just very fascinating to find out that, you know, in 108 years of Bitcoin still around, people are still using it, still operating, um, that will be the block reward for what the miners get and what they're competing for. Look, I, I, I do think that to a degree, yes, expectations are there for happenings being priced in, that the supply shock isn't necessarily as detrimental as more happenings go on. However, I think it is still valid to understand that there is less supply now being given to exchanges by these miners to then sell off to the additional new users that are going to continue to come into Bitcoin. I actually think that the halving cycle is very valid. And unless we make a new all-time high before the next happening, it kind of feels as though we're poised to just sort of like linger, bounce maybe all the way back up to 60K, maybe 70K, even just for like shits and giggles. But I have a hard time kind of discrediting the happening when it, there's still whole Bitcoins being awarded. Now that changes 20 years down the line. That changes, you know, when all of a sudden you have the block reward size diminishing and seeing that transaction fee being the main source of income for miners. I'm curious, just generally speaking here right now, like, is there a cause for concern in any of these instances when I believe it's going to be in 12 years or at this point, 14 years, so three happenings to where we'll have a block reward size of less than one whole Bitcoin. And then, I mean, we're probably decades away from seeing a, the, the fees to transact on chain being more expensive or providing more sats than the block reward itself. P, hey, you're muted. You can go ahead. Foiled again. Um, my, I guess I, I don't think that'll be an issue. That's uh, I think that uh, the way that it was that Satoshi does set the system up is that as Bitcoin becomes more popular, as more and more people understand its value, 
and thus the fiat value of Bitcoin increases over time, um, the block reward goes down. And I think that was a brilliant way to slowly, you know, kind of um, backdoor Bitcoin into the public perception. I think that by the time we get to, you know, as the block reward continues to decrease, transaction fees will be a larger and larger and larger on-chain transaction fees will be a larger and larger uh, motivator for miners to continue to contribute to the security of the network. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't even talked about how Bitcoin uh, creates a, a new energy market. And I think that's really, really important as well. And uh, I guess the short version is I'm not particularly worried about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not worried with about it as much either. Uh, I think, you know, the system plays out that it is. Uh, I mean, this is just my mental framework. You know, you can steal this or you can say I'm completely wrong. But I see Bitcoin's base layer becoming like the new SWIFT system. And I know it's like you hate to compare things to the legacy system, but like it's going to be the way that large corporations or banks or companies settle debts. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be instantaneous, but within the coming weeks or months. Uh, in the and this is like I said, speaking in the future. Right now, you can still send things on the main chain. Obviously, the mempool is a little bogged up right now, or it's a little bit more expensive, uh, should I say, to uh, exchange on the main uh, main chain. But I think Lightning is going to be the everyday equivalent of what everyone's using for. It's like your credit card. You know, you don't even realize when you swipe your credit card or use your debit card, like what's going on in the background. But it just works. And I think that's going to be what the Lightning is uh, for everyone else. It's going to be an easy driver for that. Um, I think privacy needs to increase, increase across the board. Obviously, that's difficult with being a pseudo-anonymous ledger or an open source ledger that everyone can see. Obviously, it's not like when you transact Q or P, it doesn't say like, this address is owned by Q or P, but obviously, if you bought it from exchange, they have your KYC information or, or whatever. They know that it was you transacting that amount or any amount that leaves that wallet after it was sent to you in the beginning. Um, obviously, there's... Uh, people say, you know, you either lost in a boating accident or if someone steals your private keys, that's no longer you in control of it. But um, there is uh, a deterministic link that they're trying to basically always, it, it's a game of percentages. And they're saying, you know, if it left from this exchange with this information to this person, uh, there's an 85% chance if it moves, it's probably that same person. Obviously, like I said, there's theft, you could lose them, you could get recovered 100 years from now with a supercomputer, uh, whatever it may be, but for the most most likely, they're projecting that you're the one that holds it. So I know o Odell always brings up important points of trying to get non-KYC Bitcoin and such. I'm curious to like, obviously miners are the best resource but like for the two of you do you have any recommendations on like best areas or best places to seek out kyc free bitcoin um there isn't an you know i think spinning up your own miner is both an incredibly important learning experience go try to find uh you know a used s9 don't do it because you're expecting to make a ton of bitcoin do it because it will give you an invaluable and important understanding of how the Bitcoin network actually works and how, again, how those incentive structures are set up. Um, but I think mining your own Bitcoin is the most effective way to get KYC free Bitcoin. There's other tools that, you know, we, you know, can talk about and I'm sure we'll talk about in, in future episodes around how to further, you know, obfuscate and, uh, you know, your own specific spending patterns, like Whirlpool, Samurai Wallet, things like that, which are also very important. But ultimately, I think mining your own Bitcoin is, you know, one of the best ways to get KYC free Bitcoin. You can also buy it from friends. If your friends have Bitcoin and they want to sell it to you, that's a fantastic way to get KYC free Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Q. Yeah, I think there's cool ways to do it. I used RoboSats. You can use uh, BISC. With a, which is a you know non-KYC exchange. Uh, getting from your friends, I think, is great. I think mining is great. We talked about that with Econo Alchemist on Monday. He has a great segment. If you guys haven't already seen it, go back and check that out. Second half or the second hour of the two-hour long or two three-hour long live stream. So yeah, definitely check that out. Yeah, BISC is fantastic. B-I-S-Q. 
That is a mm -hmm. fantastic way to get KYC for Bitcoin. I can't believe I didn't say that. Yep, I'll drop those in the chat for people to check out if they'd like and uh, send it over to you, Q. Way to go, Pete. You had one job. You had one job. Um, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break and we're going to be joined by the CEOs of Bolt and Wire to hear about their new, their recent merger and how they're going to help shape uh, commerce in the Bitcoin landscape. So stick around, guys. guys for sticking around through that commercial break and we are now joined by the ceos of bolt and wire yanni and maju how are you guys doing today fantastic thank you for having us crew yeah fired up thank you awesome well why don't we just dive right into things there was a big announcement about a month ago between your two companies i'll let you guys sort of share those details with everyone yeah, so Bolt, we are a, a one-click checkout company for all of commerce, and we have been looking at ways to expand into, into crypto, uh, and, and, and we started talking to a lot of different companies, and we ran into Wire, and we found that Wire is the best company that's aligned with us, both from a strategy perspective and culture perspective, and we continued that conversation and uh, signed the definitive agreement for merger, uh, recently, I announced at the Bitcoin conference recently. Yanni, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited. Um, so yeah, we we announced uh, a definitive agreement to merge into Bolt. Um, you know, uh, Wire for um, just for those that don't know, we've been around since 2012, starting the, the crypto ecosystem to help people buy things using their Bitcoin. Uh, and over the years, we realized that it's really really difficult to you know uh, build applications in in the crypto space. So. We, we ended up spending the past like eight, nine years really building an infrastructure and making it easy for people to build into crypto. And uh, when Bolt approached us last year uh, and, and, and we were working more with Bolt, we, you know, it came, we came to the realization that there's nothing better out there to getting Bitcoin into the hands of billions of people than really partnering with like one of the largest uh, payments companies in the world. So we're really excited that uh, we're taking a step forward and getting it in the hands of billions of people. Awesome. And so will the team at Wire be staying on to help this transition or walk us through a little bit of how this merger is going to shape up for the two companies? Yeah, so um, Bolt provide one-click checkout for all merchants. So we are one of the decentralized players and we make sure that the, the, the power of one-click checkout can be achieved for merchants without having to stay in any large one ecosystem. Like you can stay in Amazon or Shopify, you can get some of those features, but it's not available for anyone else. So we build the biggest shopper accounts network that's available for everyone across the merchants, irrespective of whatever platforms they work on. So decentralization is a key aspect for us. And so crypto and Bitcoin comes play right into that and that mission of decentralization and bringing all the different options and bring taking out of some of the larger you know bigger entities and putting it into the, the putting the power into the common people is kind of our mission so with wire we'll continue that mission our mission is very aligned bringing crypto and bitcoin to everyone bring it to the masses so the way we are going to operate is bolt 
has the shopper accounts network. So we have um, you know, tens of millions of shoppers, all their payment information and all their shopping information. We also have a fraud system that makes sure that all the transactions are proper. And it's, it's one of the most advanced fraud system in the industry. Uh, and so we are bringing that, those two, the shopper accounts network with tens of millions of shoppers and the advanced power of the, uh, the, the fraud system and connect that with the wires uh, crypto infrastructure. So with that, we will be able to bring one-click crypto available for everyone. And also for shoppers who want to pay on merchants with Bitcoin, they can do that with one click. Or if shoppers want to buy things on in the metaverse, we can take, take out all the friction and make it happen in, in, with the one click. The way we are going to organize is, uh, Yanni is going to be con continue to lead the charge of it. He's going to be the chief crypto officer. We think that will be the, the, the title, maybe the first title that will be used by a lot of companies as we go forward. And uh, so Yanni will continue to lead the, the mission and charter just like he's doing with Wire right now. Yanni, go ahead. Yeah, I think you I think you summed it up perfectly. So yeah, uh, back to that. It's like, yeah, we're, we're gonna still uh, be aligning, building our crypto infrastructure, building our Bitcoin infrastructure um, and still providing uh, on-ramp into Bitcoin, right? And uh, this, uh, we're, we'll still have like, some of the teams will get merged in, but like we'll be standalone just building together with both. Uh, Maju, do you mind maybe sharing a little bit of some of the clients you guys already have or are working with just so our customer or our audience can get a better sense of where they're actually going to be interacting with this technology? Yeah, so today Bolt is helping largely with online commerce. So we have a variety of customers all the way from really small customers to really large enterprises. So we recently signed Fanatics as one of the largest and fastest growing e-commerce company. They are picking us for powering their one-click checkout experience on all their platform across the board. Um, two, we have uh, merchants in across various categories. We have merchants um, like, let's say, like patio furniture, like Pollywood or, or you know, barbecue, uh, but like outdoor uh, systems like uh, solo stuff. Uh, we have apparel industry, like Lucky Jeans, Forever 21. We have, uh, you know, we have a, a very broad spectrum of merchants. So anyone selling online, we will remove the, the friction from the process. So that anything people, our vision is that people should be able to go to any website that sell anything and can buy with one click, even though they have never been on that site ever before. And how will merchants be able to opt into this? Will it be just like as they're setting up, just like checking a box or what sort of gets set up on the back end for them to receive payments in Bitcoin? Yeah, so the Bolt powers that take over the checkout for a merchant and that includes managing their shipment option as well as payments. Bolt today integrates with all payment options. Like we connect with all different credit card uh, payment processors. We connect with all the alternate payment options. Uh, and with, with Wire, we are going to be connecting with crypto and Bitcoin. So for merchants, what we, ha what we have become is a single window into the payments world. So historically merchants have to build, you know, whenever they want to add a payment processor, they have to build a connection for the payment processor. And switching from one payment processor to another payment processor is a big challenge for them. Or when they want to add an alternate payment, whether that's an Apple Pay or Google Pay, that's an extra work for them. What Bolt has done is we pre-built all those integrations. We, can, we are connected with all the payment processors, alternate payments, and now with Bitcoin and all the crypto infrastructure, we are pre-building all that connections. And for merchants now who use Bolt, they can turn on all this payment option as a configuration. They don't need to write a single line of code. They don't need to, that, like it's more, it, we made it into a configuration. So they just go there to the configuration and enable that. Okay, I want to enable, let's say Bitcoin payment. And they just check that box. And now they can take, uh, accept Bitcoin as well as consumer, the shoppers can pay with Bitcoin just with one click. Yeah, I think that's like, I, I think it's like very um, understated, like how massive this is going to be. Some of the largest brands overnight, We'll be able to accept Bitcoin on the websites and 
uh, Opal Bolt as being one of the largest Bitcoin payment processors in the space um, overnight. So we're really excited to get this out. We're working to get, obviously we're, we're working together and getting that feature out, but like some of the biggest brands in the space overnight will be able to accept crypto uh, or Bitcoin specifically, which is going to be huge. I'm curious how, so if I'm understanding this correctly, not only will merchants be able to like interact with customers and accept payments in Bitcoin, but like their suppliers, their manufacturers, or their shipping bills, those can also get handled as such, correct? Well, it's mainly, our product is mainly designed for consumer buying from a merchant sites. So like we have like 800 plus merchants now that use Bolt and we have, you mentioned like 10 million plus shoppers that already have accounts with us. So what we are enabling is those millions of shoppers to buy from any of the, the large group of merchants with the power of one click. Now with Bitcoin, it's the power of one click. Uh, buy with Bitcoin with one click. So we don't support anything beyond that behind the scenes for merchants with their suppliers. It's more that interaction between the actual consumer and the merchant. And Yanni, talk to me a little bit about where this transaction is happening on within the Bitcoin ecosystem. Is this in layer one or above it on the Lightning Network in layer two? Yeah, so we're we're working right now with the Lightning Network and we're going to be releasing some APIs to build uh, easier into the Lightning Network, which should be huge. Uh, right now, um, so the way that's going to work is that uh, we're, we're simply, there's a multi-state phase just for this, right? So First phase is actually getting an on-ramp product. So we have one of the largest on-ramps, uh, Bitcoin on-ramps in the space where you can use a credit card, debit card, and be able to on-ramp directly into Bitcoin and different platforms. So we make it super easy for applications all over the space to be able to have this like on-ramp functionality. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, Bolt's really perfected that in e-commerce. They probably, they have the best shopping experience. So if you go on like Forever 21 and Lucky Brands and all uh, Tyler's and, and, uh, and other merchants in the space, you can literally use one click, save your payment information, and then just start buying immediately. So the first phase that we're going to do is we're going to bring this one click functionality to Bitcoin. So, uh, we're going to make it super easy for developers to have kind of like on-ramp providing uh, this like incredible experience to on-ramp directly into the platforms. The second, the second phase is really bringing Bitcoin payment processing to Bolt's merchants. Um, and that's going to look very similar. Um, it's it's going to be a supercharge because it's going to be ready out of the gate. So there's not going to be any integration work. So uh, Bolt's done a really incredible job really working with some of the aggregators out there. So like the big commerce is the um, and, and other like the Magentos of the world. So there's a lot of merchants that have this out of the box. And um, we're going to be able to bring Bitcoin payment processing directly to all those merchants and start accepting it over, over it, you know, overnight, basically. And how that's going to work is it's going to be, you know, they go through the, uh, the checkout flow um, and they'll be presented with a QR code and uh, consumers will be able to shop directly uh, on those merchants. And then the merchants will be able to either hold it in Bitcoin, right? So hold the asset in Bitcoin and um, and there's like all of this cool stuff happening right now where it's making it easier for corporations to actually store Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Um, you know, like uh, the, the accounting association just like did some really awesome stuff, uh, with putting an initiative and in making that easier for merchants to do that. And then, um, or they'll have the option to convert that instantly into fiat and, and paying out their suppliers if they, if they choose. So we're making it super seamless for uh, merchants to have that, that capability. Um, and I think we'll be, uh, Bolt will be the largest Bitcoin payment processor overnight um, when that happens. So in terms of volume and, and in terms of, I, don't quote me on that, but uh, I, I think that overnight there, I think they'll, they'll be one of the largest Bitcoin payment processors, which is going to be super exciting. So that's like the second phase. The third phase, which is really uh, kind of really ties in everything is uh, kind of downstream. I, I bought in, in, I, in, I don't know how much of this is, uh, you know, both in the in process of like working on a wallet and um, and once that wallet is is enacted, then making it one click from the wallet and storing a Bitcoin balance in the wallet and then paying directly on these merchants um, is going to be super streamlined. So really closing that loop, uh, the, the whole closed loop network uh, or open network that they have through merchants, wallets, shoppers is, is going to be powerful. So that's really a three-step phase approach that we're working on. Um, and it's it's going to be extremely powerful when when it's all up and running. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that, that's exactly right. Like what we are doing is we have this shopper accounts network with all their payment information. 
Now, we allow them to store, you know, save their Bitcoin wallets, you know, connect them or store them into our account. Now, they are allowed, they are, they can, they have the opportunity to go and buy whatever they want to buy on the internet without any friction, just buy with one click. And that's where our fraud is very important. Our fraud systems are very important because one of the biggest challenge from merchants or anyone doing this transaction is how can they do that safely? Right? They, they are worried about that, that. And that's what we constantly hear from everyone. And so the, the power of our shopper accounts network, a power of our advanced fraud system, and the power of the identity we have, the power of connections we already have deeply integrated with the merchants, that is bring, making it much easier for people to use it, merchants to accept and a path to bring it mainstream. Uh, Yanni, for this wallet, I'm assuming it's going to be a hot wallet or will it be a cold storage wallet? Um, so it, it, it will, So we have, uh, just to take it a step back, uh, while it has, Wire has like custodial services. So we provide APIs to make it easier for people to build a non-custodial and custodial uh, wallets. So uh, right now we power a lot of like applicate. We make it super easy for developers to come in and have this like simple API where we can spin up wallets and they can either decide to store the key on the device or they can decide, decide to store the key in our centralized servers. We try to make it easy for people to get up and running. Uh, so there's an option of integrating both. Uh, it's undecided which route we um, we will we'll go with uh, with the Vault wallet, but it's, uh, you know, we want to make it super easy for people to have the flexibility of interacting with a non-custodial and custodial. So it's kind of merging the experiences together. So I think though, um, we'll, we'll definitely take those, uh, you know, I'm a huge point for non uh, uh, kind of like decentralization and, 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 and only, you know, you own your keys and uh, own your money type situation. So we are, we'll definitely take those considerations in the design phase for sure. Absolutely. Are there plans to have the code for the wallet be open source or will that be controlled by Bolt? That's a good question. Uh, that is a really good question. Uh, Maju, I'll let you decide on that. Well, I mean, I, I think that's a great question. I don't think we haven't made a decision on that that yet. Um, so that great question will certainly let you know once we kind of evolve through that thinking process. Like uh, we are a big, decentralization is core to our DNA. And what our goal is to bring, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, and all the crypto infrastructure available, bring it to everyone, right? Like whether that's merchants, like we are seeing demand from merchants, right? Like merchants are seeing that by looking at some numbers, they are seeing that people, the merchants who are accepting crypto, they're seeing a higher number of shoppers, new shoppers, net new shoppers, like 40% of net new shoppers show up on merchants who are accepting crypto. And also the shoppers who are paying with crypto, they tend to like spend twice as much as uh, than the, the shoppers who are using credit card. So from an economics perspective, merchants really want the access to it. The reason they are not act, they're able to, to kind of take advantage of that is there, it's a multi-step process and there's a lot of risk involved and really nobody simplifying those things. Our goal really is to like, simplify all of that, remove all the friction from the process so that when a merchant wants to turn on crypto and take advantage of all this net new shopping, shopper segment that they don't have access to today, and we can make that happen just without writing any code because it's already written for them and all the connectivity is available. And that brings a lot more options for shoppers because now they don't have to go and find you know, the, the few shops that accept. Now the world, is dropping that. And also, also the shopping experience itself is changing, right? Like more and more shoppers are not just shopping on a merchant website. People are shopping on social media. People are shopping by, you know, looking at blog. If they, they follow somebody on an influencer, they see something, they want to have, you know, the ability to like provide a one click, you know, one click and it's yours. And those infrastructure is not available for everyone today. And that's what Bolt has. So when a merchant uses Bolt, they can provide a great shopping experience on their site, including acceptance of Bitcoin. So now they have access to this, you know, the, the new generation segment with, you know, who, are, who are high value shoppers for them and make that shopping experience easy everywhere when they extend that product out to social media or one of their influencers connecting their, or displaying their product rather than clicking it, taking it to a link, bank to merchant. Now they have five more steps to pay with Bitcoin. Now it's like you see something on the video, you just click one click, 
it's done. And we power that entire connectivity and the transactions and also manage the fraud behind the scenes. That's the vision and that's why we are excited about it. And as we, we like when we do that, everything, you know, like Bitcoin become even more mainstream uh, in the commerce world. That's what we are excited about. Now, how exactly we make it happen? We, we're constantly working with the developers and merchants and customers to see you know, what, what's important for them and you know, what are the friction? How can we help? Whatever is helpful to make that all happen, we'll do it. I'm genuinely curious of just sort of how much education, I know that you've explained out sort of what the incentive is for these merchants to accept Bitcoin and crypto at large as payments, but what education is going into these merchants to understand better sort of what is going on, if any at all, or is this simply just a, hey, this is a new product we're offering? And maybe what questions are your merchants asking you about Bitcoin and this new offering as it's being rolled out? Yeah, so it's a great question. So we are, you know, I, I speak to customers every day and one of the things that constantly come on top for everyone is what is their crypto strategy? So everyone is thinking about it, but the problem is people don't know a lot of, details like the education like you mentioned is less they understand they, their awareness of crypto they understand it's good but they don't really know how to go after it and also when they want to go after it the 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 the, the bar they have to pass to like you know understanding crypto understanding all the different companies now talk about the implementation integration those are steps nobody is ready to take because there's so many other things going on so this is why Bolt bringing up this product is very powerful for them because Bolt is already integrated into the merchant. And if they can take advantage of this without having to study the whole thing and like go and do an entire market research and make it available, now they can do an A-B test. Like they can turn it on for you know, a couple of months and see what's happening and see the results for themselves. And so education is important. But awareness is there, education is important, but what is even more powerful is make it so that they don't even have to think about it. They make it an option and a configuration they can maybe test, see the power for themselves, and then make decisions based on numbers. Yeah, I think uh, just a uh, much if I can add, um, I don't, I'm, obviously we, we work with like a lot of developers, so I'm not in more in tune with the merchants, but I think it's like coming in the fore light. I think that where, you know, all these like Fortune 500 companies kind of last year, in the past couple of years, adding Bitcoin to the balance sheet has definitely brought a whole different perspective to just, you know, hey, well, how do we get this asset, right? How do we uh, sell goods and actually get Bitcoin and then store it on the on the balance sheet? And I think that's like a, uh, and, and hedging against, you know, a lot of people have cash on the balance sheets and hedging against um, whatever macro economic environment there might uh, might be. So I think that uh, there, there's probably a, a different conversation as well happening on that sort of side, right? Where it's like, you know, obviously we're going to get a new demographic in, right? We're, we're going to get new shoppers coming into the ecosystem. They spend more. There, there's a lot of studies around that, which is really exciting. But the second side is like, hey, this is an easy way to also get Bitcoin on the balance sheet, right? And this is something that we can store. And, um, and I think that, there, that, that those conversations have been brought, you know, with, um, yeah, you know, huge companies adding that on like MicroStrategy and Tesla and a few others um, over the past couple of years. So we're really, I, I think it's going to be really exciting uh, as leveraging that on a macroeconomic standpoint. Not telling you how to run your company, Maju, but it kind of sounds like your next project should definitely build to build to be to build out that infrastructure for everyone who's holding their Bitcoin on balance sheets after they've collected money from their customers to then now spend it to their suppliers and so on. But that's just my two cents on it. After hearing after hearing the last like five minutes, that's where my head is going after you guys roll this out is all right now, how do these merchants unlock using their Bitcoin more and more? Um, I'm curious right now, how much, how many payments are being processed by Bolt on a daily or maybe on an annual basis? I don't know if you have those numbers handy. Well, I mean, uh, we we pay billions of dollars a year. So it, it our, we have a fairly large customer base and most of our customers tend to be larger uh, sites so even though the number of customers i mean it's more but the they are most of them are on the larger side so we transact you know billions of dollars of transaction every year and one of the advantage also bolt has is when bolt is on a merchant site 
we take over the entire checkout. So we are not like a separate button for checkout. You know, there, there are so many different buttons nowadays uh, to do the checkout on a checkout screen. And they don't get, the consumer will have to make a choice if they want to click one of those buttons. Bolt does not follow that pattern. We replace the merchant's main checkout. So we bring the power of one click into their native workflow. That means for us is we get all the transactions that are happening on the merchant side flow through our system. So we are able to sit at a higher level and help merchants to choose the different payment options they want to use, which is why us enabling Bitcoin means it's not a, a consumer has to make two choices now, you know, pick both, you know, Bolt and then pick Bitcoin from that. It's like uh, Bolt is already integrated into the merchant's workflow and checkout. And if Bitcoin is their default payment, no decision made. The minute you type in your email address and say you want to, uh, you know, we recognize you and immediately we know your payment options. It's all natively built into the account. So we can make it happen much better than any of the other kind of a separate uh, workflow that getting added on to checkout. Marjorie, I'm curious. At what point during the transaction is Bolt receiving some sort of a cut or fee? Is that more felt on the merchant side or I'm assuming it is, but at what point or where in that transaction cycle is that happening? Yeah, we, we the way we charge is when we charge only when we help a merchant. So we charge when we can enable a one-click transaction for a merchant. So if we help, then we we take a small benefit out of that. So think of it's like a small uh, percentage of the, uh, the, the GMV transactions when we help merchant with their one click transaction, which they wouldn't have gotten otherwise without both. So, and, and that's great economics for merchants because we know that whenever a merchant can provide a one click transaction where people don't have to type in all the information, they see that around 60% increase in conversion happens at that time. So, it's a high likelihood of conversion, which is great when the e-commerce is awesome. It's also amazing when, when you have fewer number of shoppers on your site, again, converting them, it's become you know, even more important. So providing that one-click transaction is a great conversion benefit lift for merchants, for, for, for merchants through shoppers. Now, the, the, also the interesting fact is a shopper who get a one-click checkout experience, there's a 50% chance that they will come back and become a repeat customer. So we help initially with the, the trans, either the, you know, converting a visitor into a, a, an actual customer. And then we help a customer into a lifetime customer. So we are truly a merchant friendly company. And we want to make sure that the merchants can compete and win during this, you know, like the difficult times and especially create more competition and choices in the market for shoppers. So helping merchants to convert and, and you know, maintain their customers and keep them as a lifetime customer is what we go for. And we, the economics work for both sides, it's a win-win. I just had a question and I'm really mad at myself <laughs> because it was, it, oh, damn, I keep trying to type these up, but I did want to get a sense from the two of you on just how uh, or what you guys envision being like some of the hurdles in merchants use. Oh, actually, no, that's not the question I wanted to ask. Online shopping and just online in general, virtual stuff, we're on Zoom right now. That really picked up two years ago. And we have slowly been seeing over the course of the last like six months, people wearing thin of the online experience and going back and defaulting to in-person things. How has the online merchant business been doing for e-commerce in general through Bolt's eyes and perspective? Well, the industry trends, as you rightly pointed out, is that you know pandemic accelerated e-commerce probably a decade ahead. So uh, it, it's nothing new. We don't see any new trends. We're just seeing that it just accelerated fast. And also, like I mentioned before, people are more comfortable. You know, shoppers are becoming more conscious. They care about where they buy from. Just because it's cheap or fast doesn't matter. You know, they care where it's coming from. Uh, who are they supporting? Is that a local brand? You know, do they understand the brand? What the brand stands for? All of those became more and more important. So, what that means for merchants is like you really need to tell your story to the shopper. 
So to tell the story, you need to really understand who the shopper is. You need to know their identity. You need to communicate to them. And so a system like Bolt become very important for them because we are that identity provider. We identify the shopper, we recognize them so that the brands can tell their story, whether they are local, whether it's what they stand for, are they sustainable you know, for the world and, and where who they are supporting. All of those become very important. Now, same way with the, the buying at different places at the point of discovery, inspiration, you know, point of inspiration, people are buying from influencers. Again, the same thing, you know, really understand the customer, irrespective of where they are buying from, whether they are buying from your site or anywhere else. Now, the e-commerce trend during the pandemic, it accelerated. Now, we are seeing a little bit of deceleration of that from an industry perspective, not just from both uh, merchant side, but generally in the industry, if you look at the numbers, e-commerce trending too, more like a, you know, slightly more, but trending towards the pre-pandemic kind of uh, a, a, a range. What that means for all merchants is, now you need to be even more thoughtful on connecting with the market, your shoppers, because now you, you know you really need to keep your shoppers. You really need to like provide a great experience when they come there, and you really need to make sure that they understand who you stand for. So, Bolt is providing a great value for merchants throughout the journey, through the uptime, through the trans, the change in the industry, and you know as as we continue. But overall. My view, the personal view on, and kind of been working in e-commerce for the last decade or so uh, is that you know, e-commerce will continue to grow and e-commerce will evolve and change. The omni-channel will become the output of this. What that means is people all went to online. Now stores are coming back. And so a, a, a mixed uh, omni-channel experience where you can go to a store, you know, whether it, and you can still get the online experience there. Like we, we have products like QR code products where you can put a QR code right next to a product in the physical store and you can scan that QR code. You can hey, learn more about that product. You can even order a slight variance of that product that's not in that store, but we can provide a lot of that experience. And the same way that experience there connecting with your virtual experience, you buy something in the physical world, how can you represent that in the, in the, in the virtual world? So connecting your Zoom virtual life, connecting the physical store, connecting the online shopping, people want that omni-channel experience and whoever can solve that is going to be kind of driving the innovation and both mission is to kind of drive that. And we, we are in investing and innovating in all those spaces. And we are working closely with customers to navigate through that. But you know, whether it's an up or a down, that's when innovation happen. And that's when you can really differentiate between who really have a long-term view and who they don't. And we are lucky to have great customers and partners who are thinking really long-term, want to innovate with us, experiment with us. And uh, you know, I think with Yanni and the wire team is going to be like part and parcel of this whole uh, experience we want to drive for the future. Uh, Yanni, I want to ask you something you brought up earlier, just about like the simplicity of using wire, like as easy as linking a credit card and then boom, you're off kind of to the races. Can you also maybe touch on a little bit of what I had asked uh, Maju to talk about through Bolt's perspective of fees and where wires uh, really making most of their money there? Yeah, absolutely. So we have two businesses. One is our on-ramp business. And then our, our second business is our API infrastructure. Uh, really kind of the stripe for crypto or the stripe for Bitcoin uh, per se. So our first our, our first part, our part of the business is the on-ramp. Uh, we make it super simple. We connect to all the payment methods, cards, ACH, wires, uh, SEPA, global bank transfers, make it super, super simple. You know, nice widget where you can uh, redirect your customers to this widget. We take care of all the regulation, the fraud, the, um, the, the conversion of the USD to, or like fiat into crypto or to Bitcoin. We make it super simple in this widget, uh, and um, and then we we enable within with low KYC to no KYC, uh, low friction to be able to buy uh, crypto and deposit directly into a platform, and that's like what we saw. So if a developer comes, you know, developers come into space and they're like trying to build out the next Coinbase, so they're trying to build out the next Square Cash app, or you know, it takes a lot of work. It takes like a lot of like years of planning it takes you you have to get the regulatory hurdles and uh and you have to build a liquidity engine to actually convert you have to build to all these payment channels so as a developer out in this space we make it super easy for people to have this on-ramp functionality into their application and and uh we started out with that mission around 2018 how do we really 
get billions and billions of people in the space. And this was a big problem that, and I, I'd still, I'd still say that, you know, this is a big problem that we're still focusing on right now on ramping. So the way that we make fees, uh, we, we obviously provide a lot of value there. So we charge a fee, um, you know, for cards, it's 2.99% uh, plus 30 cents for, for domestic payments. And then for international, it's 3.99%, very similar to what you'd pay another uh, card processing company, but you get so much more. Uh, we indemnify for all the fraud, right? So if uh, every single transaction that comes through, the merchant doesn't have to worry about that. We we run our fraud engine and with both fraud engine that we're working together on, it's going to be even better. Um, there, and the second thing is we take care of all the liquidity, uh, converting US dollars to Bitcoin and do, setting it on the blockchain, the ecosystem um, is, is, you know, and getting the best rate at different values at different times is not, a, you know, it, it, it's an easier problem, but when we started in 2012, 2013, it's like a quite difficult problem to actually solve this like liquidity engine. Um, so we make it super simple and that, that's, a, that's what we charge there. Um, and then for our API infrastructure, it's completely free to use uh, upfront um, and you can come to us and we charge pay as you go type model where you, you know, as your business scales up, we you charge per transaction fee. Uh, so it's um, it's quite simple. We make it super easy for developers to come in and, and start building immediately with us. Yeah, that's the the beauty of Wire. I thought you know it's very uh, very smart how Yanni and the team has built this over time is kind of build the API layer so that every developer who want to build something around this, they can build it like without any friction, and they made it super easy and simple and comprehensive. I think Wire is. I mean, it is, Wire is the most comprehensive API stack that's available on the market. So, and I spoke a lot of developers who are trying to like cobble together applications by building pieces from different places, or they can just come to Wire and Wire provides everything top to bottom. So I think the, the, that's a big enabler for developers. And you know, how many developers you have already using the, the system today? Yeah, so we have uh, roughly, uh, over, and then, we have uh, over four to 5,000 developers playing around at any given time on our API stack uh, with end users in the in the tune of like six to seven million end users from those platforms. So uh, just to, uh, tying into what Maja said, 100%, like we we want to, we provide a full end to end stack. So if you're trying to build a Coinbase in less than a few hours, uh, we provide you with the wallet infrastructure, we provide you with the payment infrastructure to send money in, we provide you with the payout infrastructure to pay out money, and then the whole liquidity engine from moving US dollars to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to US dollars, or US dollars to Bitcoin, Bitcoin to Euros, and move value across the entire planet. We're very much a global player as well. So we are, we're not just focused with uh, uh, in the US, we have other jurisdictions and uh, we take care of all the hurdles around the regulatory front. So we have like the uh, money transmission licenses, we have licenses all over the world. And a lot of these developers, they could just leverage, uh, come in, leverage our, our infrastructure to do that. So. Uh, we are really an end-to-end -end player. So, you know, if say I want to build a Bitcoin payment processor, there's a lot that goes into that. You have to build the QR system, QR code system. You have to build the liquidity, the payout system to pay out your merchants once they get Bitcoin into US dollars or some fiat currency. So the, it, there's a lot of pieces and you can come to Wire and just build that out in less than, less than a couple of hours. So uh, we make it super simple for people to build out uh, products. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Like that's the, the power I've seen is like, you know, you can, can build your own Coinbase in a couple of hours, which is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, look, given everything that Coinbase has been going through over the last 48 <laughs> hours, there's surely about to be a new Coinbase popping up soon enough. Um, I love the simplicity of building uh, applications. It's a necessity, I think, in the larger ecosystem and will feed well. Um, so just the growth and use cases of Bitcoin. I, however, have another question that is probably more personal because this is my nightmare. Uh, and my nightmare is spending my Bitcoin because of the tax implications of that. What processes, if any, have you guys sort of put in to help customers kind of not get so tepid about maybe spending a few hundred dollars in Bitcoin, but then figuring out how that tax hurdle uh, is going to play into effect for them? Yeah, this is, a, this is a problem that everyone's seeing. I get paid in Bitcoin, uh, and a lot of people at Wire get paid in, in Bitcoin as well. Uh, so it, it's always kind of the hurdle. It's like, uh, hey, I get paid. There's cap gains tax on my payroll. Uh, so I'm kind of getting double paid every time I spend. And I'm just like, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's great. 
Uh, I usually have a hundred dollars in cash in my bank account. Don't tell, don't tell my mom, but I have a lot, you know, a decent amount of Bitcoin in my payroll. But, but um, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I think this is, this stems to a regulatory front on how, uh, um, you know, Germany just made it no cap gains taxes for the first like two years. Uh, so there is some regulation coming in spent on how you use Bitcoin, right? So not every, like if you look in the fiat world, like not every dollar is treated the same, like how you invest dollars in, and securities is different than how you invest dollars in property and, and so forth. And I think that uh, regulation will catch up there. And, and if we want this to be a, a global currency, we, um, you know, which we, we do, and we want it to be a decentralized currency, there's going to be some merger of this centralized world and the decentralized world in this. And, and there needs to be some kind of understanding on like, hey, this is Bitcoin payable. Um, and there, your cap scan taxes shouldn't be... Uh, denominated there but it is a I, I don't have a good answer to that i i you i i wish uh, i wish I, if anybody does i think it'd be very interesting i think that the the only thing is like you, we want to get into a place where you're using bitcoin and spending bitcoin right so like you're getting paid in bitcoin and then you're actually just paying for things in bitcoin and i think the integration of bolt here is going to help us get a step closer there right so we'll be able to there's 800 more merchants uh where i can now spend my bitcoin and that gets me closer to living in this uh beautiful uh, Bitcoin only uh, economy, which we're really excited about. Yeah. You touch on it a little bit, Yanni, and, I, and I, I'd love for both of you to, to maybe discuss uh, the legislative efforts around Bitcoin and crypto at large can be both helpful and hurtful to long-term benefits. We're seeing a country like Panama introduce broader crypto legislation to essentially figure out a way to back channel Bitcoin and, and others as currency in that country. We saw El Salvador's news last year. We saw the news out of Central African Republic just I think now only two weeks ago. Uh, I'm curious what legislative efforts you guys are paying very close attention to, uh, if any at all. Well, I mean, I'd say like, you know, obviously, you know, President Biden signed the 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 study on Bitcoin, which is great. Like I I think whether you know the the legislation and everybody all the legislators really understanding and studying all the details is important because i worry that one of the biggest problem is people have this cursory understanding of things and they really don't really go deep and and so people make these assertions without really understanding the foundation and so educating and really going deep and making sure that the government spend enough time understanding all the specifics is a good thing the second thing is, you know, fraud is a, a big area of concern for any of these things, right? Like, how do we bring the identity aspect into it? How do we bring, you know, eliminate fraud so that this is more of a legal channel of transaction versus kind of more overshadowed with any kind of anything else going on there? So some legal, you know, some legislation and legalization is good as long as it is founded with deep study versus some kind of rhetoric at the very top level. And, and so that's kind of my view. We, we need to balance that. And so the education need to be strong. The fraud system need to be strong. The identity need to be strong. In that way, it just goes from just Bitcoin being used by a small group of, you know, like the people, uh, like around only 4% of the internet users use crypto today, which is a really, really small population to make it really mainstream because they don't need to worry about it because it's all taken care of. That's my view. Yanni, I'm sure you spend a lot more time on this. So. Yeah, we, we definitely do. We spend a lot of time on this. Um, you know, the, the hot, you know, so wires, uh, you know, as a whole, wire is agnostic. So we support a lot of different currencies, just uh, not just Bitcoin, but we spend a lot of time in, in stable coins and there's a lot of fiasco around stable coins and, and uh, a lot of work that, that is happening there. And obviously algorithmic and which uh, with the UST uh, fiasco happening now could be very interesting, but also to you know, some centralized uh, stable coins as well. Um, so there, there's a lot of work that we went, uh, that we spent a lot in the past year really promoting. I think long term, uh, Bitcoin has the is the the stable currency that we need, right? Like in the long run. So like it, it's just a, a the time horizon that everyone's playing. Uh, like we're trying to put current regulation in kind of like the you know everyone. It, I feel like there's a lot of pressure in 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 the regulatory bodies to do something right now, which could is 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 a positive thing, right? I think it's um you know, could help promote and provide like a playground for startups to actually, hey, we have a direction in what to do, like instead of like, you know, enforcement by action type of situation where you operate for a couple of years and then you get hit 
by the SEC with a fine without any understanding of that what you're supposed to do. So I think it, you know there is some sort of regulation that is really really healthy. But I think in terms of like uh, long term strategy, Bitcoin has is is going to be its own stable currency, right? And that is the the ultimate goal in Bitcoin. Um, um, and you know, will it fit in the current regulatory infrastructure that uh, different government bodies are are promoting right now? It's it to be determined. Uh, I think that we're probably ten to fifteen years out from that. To to be honest, where if you know you can safely use Bitcoin as a stable currency, but um, the, the, it, it's just uh, I think we're uh, what I'm trying to say. I guess is like I think we're a little too early. Hey, that was a really bad time to bring up stable currencies in a Bitcoin. <laughs> Today, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I think that either way you look at it, whether it's algorithmic or whether it's central back, there's there's uh, there's definitely pros and cons to both ways. And um, everyone thinks oh, algorithmic is the best, but we've seen, you know, uh, Terra pause their blockchain today. Like I, I can't imagine Bitcoin stopping their blockchain any day of the week, uh, anytime soon. I don't think that's even possible. Uh, so I mean, that happened in. That, that happened today with Terra, and 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 um, but we've also seen with uh, Tether, uh, also at the same time, you know, uh, central back, you know, centralized back stable currency having issues, and we've so th there there there's what we're trying what I'm trying to say is like there's a lot of regulation going into managing uh, stable currencies, right? And I think there's there's a short game that there is being had right now, and I think it's healthy in some respect, but the long game is really having a fully decentralized stable currency. That is operated without a, a central body, right? Like this is the end game for Bitcoin, and you know we're probably like ten to fifteen years out. Uh, I'm all for regulation. I'm not uh, promoting. But let's not right be they get regulated, and I'm all for regulation. Like we, a lot of what we do is make it easy for developers to play in regulatory regimes, right? Because we we do all the hard models, getting regulated with money transmission, uh, working with uh, SEC, working with the CFTC. But um, I think there there is a a, a long game there too. Also, the, even the crisis on stablecoin or all, even on all of crypto, I mean, I have the opportunity to kind of live through and kind of drive the innovation on some of the, the different industries. Uh, and even if you look like the dot-com crash did not kill the internet, it just separated, you know, the, the good ones when the bad ones or the good ones who can survive longer term. So some kind of, uh, you know, changes and corrections in the industry just kind of prove who are here to stay and who is uh, here not to stay. And I think it might be a great moment for Bitcoin to like really uh, kind of shine through all of this and provide that stability that probably nobody else has the infrastructure or the, or the, the network to, to really power through and weather through all of these things. Yeah, I mean, look, Yana, you bring it up. Terra's blockchain, no, Luna's blockchain was shut down today, right, Chris? It was Luna? Yeah. We saw it last year during the meme stock craze where you had literally the shutdown of AMC and um, GameStop stock. You couldn't trade those stocks anymore. Plenty of us have had our banks say, hey, this credit card's frozen or you can't access this bank account. So this has happened repeatedly throughout multiple different ecosystems, but it, to Yanni's point, it cannot happen in Bitcoin. That type of a concentrated attack cannot happen because of the decentralized nature of it. Um, I'm genuinely curious for the two of you to maybe speak on, you know, a lot of us in Bitcoin get really frustrated when Bitcoin and crypto get lumped together, especially by lawmakers and legislators. As these lawmakers maybe start to learn a little bit more about this ecosystem and what the different products really are, what, at what point do you guys get nervous of them striking down against Bitcoin or crypto? Is there maybe a, a securities that or a securities tag on some of these assets or on some of these crypto uh, currencies that would in turn make some of these offerings a little bit more cumbersome to roll out? Yeah, just uh, just adding, I, I think there's a lot, still a lot of education to happen, right? Uh, up until like, 20, you know, we had a lot of issues with like kind of like privacy laws in, in, in the internet era, right? And that that's, you know, the internet's been around for uh, 20 plus years. I mean, it's been around longer than that, but it's really in the 90s really started, uh, uh, really getting popularity and up until like maybe it, still to today we have a lot of like privacy issues like 
and and we see a lot of bad regulation happening i mean everyone clicks those like data privacy laws on every single eu website so there's like this is a symptom of just like bad regulation right and and not thinking forward about how we you think um uh about like uh, trust and privacy so i think that uh that's going to happen with uh, crypto and bitcoin right it's going to happen bitcoin's going to get lumped into crypto there's a lot of education that needs to happen and it, there will be um you know we are you know, Bitcoin's unstoppable now, right? There is way too much innovation happening in the space. There's way too many entrepreneurs coming to build into this ecosystem. We've seen countries adopt Bitcoin as a stable currency or as a reserve currency or even as a, a for a, a valid tender. And I think that we're just at the starting point here. Um, so I think that it all starts with education and, and there is some really good work happening there, right? Um, you see Jack Mahler is going down to El Salvador, doing incredible work, working with the president there. Uh, that's, uh, you know, more of that's going to happen uh, day in, day out. And we're doing great work here, at enabling merchants to accept Bitcoin um, and make it more valid at, to get, accept crypto or accept Bitcoin as a, as a payroll and then actually pay your Bitcoin. So I think that it, it's, it's a natural progression and you're going to have this for the next 40 years. It's, it's uh, you know, people will not, well, you know, technology moves too fast for people to understand. Um, and you'll have these decades uh, of periods of people trying to keep up. And that's just natural progression. Maja, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I think you said it well, right? Now people, you know, these are all a real, every time technology go through a transformation, the similar kind of cycle happened. There's going to be a lot of different players. It got confused and there is going to be some caution. And the ones with the most, uh, you know, network and power and the deepest technology will, will survive. So, and also people always overestimate the short-term benefits and underestimate the long-term benefits, right? So I think this is one of those scenarios, like, um, it's an educational process. A lot more people need to learn and understand. And uh, uh, people having a deep understanding of Bitcoin uh, versus just the broader crypto, all of that's going to be important. So all here to stay. Love that. And I'm, I'm genuinely curious for the two of you to maybe share. So as this offering gets rolled out to your customer base, uh, what is next? What are the sort of the goals over the next five to 10 years for the company to continue to grow? Uh, and expand its footprint in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, uh, Maj, do you want to do, do you want to start this? One? Yeah, I mean, our goal is to become make um, buy, whether it's buying or using Bitcoin and crypto broadly available everywhere. Whether that's in a virtual, like you know, starting with an online like commerce merchant, moving to the virtual world make it available in the in the physical store and pretty much make it available internationally and ubiquitous so that people whenever they think of payment you know this is it that they don't need to think about anything else they don't i mean none of the other choices we can simplify that so we want to unify that experience i talk about that omni channel experience whether that's from a you know any any transactions whether that's commerce with peer to peer um, any time you have these options of exchanging value and that exchanging value will be done based on our underneath uh, sh our shopper network that is basically a network of people, their wallets, their information, and the underlying uh, the, the fraud system that's going to use all the data and power all of these things and simplify it. So we don't really see an end to it because this is an, a, you know, ne a never ending process all over the world and spreading that and wire already has a global footprint, Bolt has a global footprint. So combining all of that and extending into the all different aspects of value being exchanged, we expect us to be there. Yeah, tying tie into that, I mean, like the, the thing that really uh, attracted us to Bolt is just their presence in kind of like the mainstream e-commerce of uh, the world, right? They have a, an incredible network of, of merchants, incredible network of shoppers that we can really get Bitcoin really mainstream to uh, a different uh, different audience, which is really exciting. And if you take a step back, I mean, like you have retail businesses uh, where the value creation has been happening. You know, retail businesses have become uh, uh, e-commerce businesses, e-commerce businesses have become fintech businesses, and fintech businesses are becoming Bitcoin businesses. And this is like the value chain of how things are gonna happen over the next like uh, five to 10 to 15 years. So it, with that mindset is like, we have a lot of work to do to get billions of people into Bitcoin, right? There's, uh, you know, on-ramps are still broken. There are broken flows that 
you know, we're trying to work with this uh, uh, different KYC processes in the legacy world that, you know, was started with uh, the banks and, and whatnot. And, you know, we can have, uh, there's a lot of improvements that we can make there. Uh, the, we're working on payment systems that have been created for the past, like in the past hundred years that we're still using today, right? People are still selling, sending mail checks around actually pay for payroll and, and whatnot. So we're just modernizing and trying to get people and build use cases to get people into Bitcoin. And, um, you know, we started this in 20, you know, I started the company in 2012 and with this vision, it's like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if people can use their Bitcoin and buy things? And, and then it's a, like every curtain that we cleared up in the financial system, we realized, what, what, do you, what do you mean ACH is built this way? Swift wires are built this way? And it's like almost this curiosity where we realize that we have a lot of work to do and getting, making it easier for people to build into this ecosystem. So this only accelerates over the, you know, in getting billions of people in the space. And I think that that vision of like, getting people into a crypto economy or a Bitcoin economy is not going to change. Um, and this is only going to accelerate the revolt. We're really excited about that. Yanni, I'm genuinely curious, like how, as you've seen sort of Bitcoin and the crypto ecosystem transform over the course of your time working within it, like what are things that have surprised you that have come up and what are things that, um, you know, you genuinely are excited about as it continues to iterate and grow in its own right? I think, uh, the, I, I think that the, what I'm surprised about in, in the current environment as well is like <laughs> where people just fall in the same traps, right? We've seen the ICO trap in 2017. We're seeing the similar trap right now. Uh, and I think that it's just fascinating. I've been through many bear market, like uh, four bear markets now. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's just fascinating seeing uh, similar traps happen in, in, in the same area and, and retail markets, you know, follow retail markets and, and people are going to get burned and they realize they educate and you find people, you know, migrating to the right environments or the right communities or right, right assets too. So it's just a, it's a, it's, it's an interesting onboarding that we've seen in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, and I, I, I think, I think it's good that it happens now. Let, let's get all this stuff out of the way in the first like 10 years of building because uh, it, this is like Bitcoin's way too big to fail right now and uh, and to get it wrong. And, you know, uh, we have a massive opportunity ahead of us. So that's a, that's what surprised me the most. I think it's extremely relevant to today as well and, and whatnot. So um, markets behaving the way that they behave. Love that. Um, awesome, guys. We're going to cut to a quick commercial break. And then we are going to bring up one last uh, quick surprise for you guys tuning in. So thank you guys and uh, stick around shortly. What's up, guys? We are back. Thank you for sticking around today through the two hours that we've gone so far. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that tickets to Bitcoin 23 are on sale now. Uh, whale passes as well as GA tickets. They will not be any cheaper than what they are now. Uh, there is a legit secondary market. So honestly, like if you want to spend some money on tickets instead of those free, free and juicy sats that are available, um, do it with an eye on reselling them. Like that is a legit business practice and we will help in the Discord channel, put you in the right channel so that you could uh, sell it. Obviously ticket prices will be going up. 
uh, as we get closer to the event. I believe the next ticket price hike uh, will be in June. So we got, you got some time, but lock in your tickets now. I don't want to hear anyone complaining, oh, they're too expensive when we get close to the event because they are as cheap as they'll ever be. Um, and dude, it's Bitcoin Disneyland, man. It's what, it's what uh, every Bitcoiner should attend and everyone who has attended just comes back raving about it and having the best time. Chris, I don't know if you wanted to add anything from this last year's trip down to Miami. Give me one sec. Um, no, oh, yeah, I mean, streams on fire. So, ah! no, streams going well. Uh, no, I, I mean, uh, it was an awesome experience. Awesome getting to meet up with over twenty five thousand Bitcoiners uh, ascending down in Miami. Uh, it was a really good time. I know many people weren't able to make it for whatever reason. We had the stream, which was really excellent and awesome as well. But uh, it's nothing beats meeting Bitcoiners in Meet Space. So definitely get your tickets at b.tc forward slash conference forward slash 2023. Those, that's where you can get your Bitcoin 2023 tickets. Uh, Q, I'll kick it back over to you. Yeah, man. I mean, look, it was so much fun. Uh, shout out to everyone who did like get a chance to come up and say what's up to us. Uh, we we're glad you guys were able to and have a great time at the conference. I mean, the speakers, the events, just everything. Like, selfishly sound manifest as i expected was just a giant party and it was so much fun um i don't know if everyone was able to stay i know a lot of people headed off and it was a very different crowd uh and even some people were showing up and unfortunately we're expecting a lot more bitcoin stuff at sound money fest so we took all of this into consideration we are planning the biggest best version of this event in 2023 so if you liked it, if you had fun, if you had FOMO for missing out from just watching us talk on the live stream, like you're gonna wanna be there in person and tickets will never be this cheap. So P, we have a wild P appearance in the Zoom oh. call. I'm back. I'm back and better than ever. Just smash bought some Bitcoin, keeping it real. Slumming it on Clubhouse, my favorite uh, voice-based only system. Should we do a, a quick little smash buy live on air? I'll give a, a nod to Cash App this time. <laughs> like well, which but, service has pleased me? But look, uh, Cash App, not a sponsor, but like, feel free to sponsor us. Also, I saw, I finally found the Cash, Wait, Cash App. Cash App is a sponsor. I mean, not, yeah. of, not, of, not of us here, but they're no. a sponsor of BTC. Sponsor the oh, show. Oh, got it. Sponsor Love the it. show. Yeah, sponsor yeah. Me. Yo, honestly, Cash App, sponsor me and throw me more of that Cash App swag. I found the store. And like Aubrey Strobel apparently like posted opening her Cash App box with all her swag. And I'm like, yo, dude, I will rock Cash App swag every day. Just throw it my way. Dude, their, their clothing line is fucking dope. Like no lie. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, there was some good stuff there. Not going to lie. But also like the Bitcoin Magazine swag is officially in Nashville now, I think. So we can slowly start shipping that out soon. So if you didn't get a chance to get any of your swag from Bitcoin 2022, it is available at the store. You can use promo code FOMO, it's only 10%, right? Yeah, promo code FOMO gets you 10% off of everything in the Bitcoin Magazine store. So be sure wallet supplies last for all the Bitcoin 22 swag that is still available, including the little hodler. I'm going to fill that whole row with little hodlers. Do it. Um, what was your favorite piece of merch from the B22 store, P? Or did you not get any merch? Uh, let me see. Uh, hold on, Chris. You just said my mic is popping. How is it now? It's good. How are my levels? You're good. Can you turn my headphones up? No, you yeah. can't because I, I have my headphones on my end. Um, that was a joke. It's a bad one. All right. Um, mine was probably the, I mean, the block clocks were fucking awesome. Um, but the see yours of, in the background. Yeah. But in terms of Bitcoin magazine merch, uh, we had some amazing t-shirts. I really love the designs that Tommy made. Um, those are my favorite. I love the uh, the windbreaker. I could live in that thing. I did for a couple of weeks and uh, I got called out from my local meetup. Like, Chris, do you wear anything besides that windbreaker? I'm like, all right, okay, fine. Point taken. Time to wash it. 
But I'm so thing. glad someone else called you out on that because when you did it three days in a row on the stream, I didn't want to be that guy, but I also wanted to be like, dude, like I get, get it. Your shit together. We don't leave the house much. Like we're on, we're just like on camera. It's a sweater, so it's not like the directly on your skin layer of your clothing, so you can kind of get away with multiple wears. But like, bro, now nah, you got to wash that shit every other day. Every other day. That was that was my moving college. I mean, my college roommates used to make fun of me when they would be like, "You have your closet where you keep your clean clothes, then you have your like your desk and chair where you have your rotating outfits, and you'll like wear a t-shirt like six times over." I'm like, oh, until I spill beer on my clothes, they're clean. Let me tell you. Oh God, uh, you know, people talk about like you know wearing your jeans until uh, until they can like stand up on their own because they're like so caked with grime. Uh, yes. I had a I had a Carhartt jacket that was like. Somebody was like, bro, I feel like if you uh, put a match near that, it would just burst into flame because it's so like, <laughs> so much like oil <laughs> from like, you know, whatever. The end. That's the end of my story. You guys are welcome. You can cherish that moment forever. It's pretty great. It's it's a way to live by pretty much. But uh, yeah, no, I got called out for, for wearing the, uh, the thing for too long. But oh, well, it's good. It's washed. It's good now. Um. What was your favorite set from Sound Money Fest? Ooh. I really enjoyed the... Um, hmm. In terms of the music itself, I really enjoyed seeing Logic. That was super fun for me. Um, in terms of the set, one of the things that was really interesting is, uh, you know, obviously I was running around behind the scenes as, as the head of programming for the conference. Um, so I had insight into all of the logistical and programmatic things that like had to do in terms of like the lightings for the state, lighting for the stages, like all the LED screens, like all that shit. And it was really interesting to see the way that, um, that the art, that the musicians used the LED walls that were behind the, um, the main stage, the Nakamoto stage. They did some really, really cool shit. I forgot who the, like, who were the, what was the lineup? Like the first lineup on SMF, you guys remember? uh i'm drawing a blank to be honest marshmallow logic um no no but on the nakamoto stage i, f I forget who it was uh san holo maybe it was san holo anyway so one of the one of the artists had this incredible like display setup where like everything like went between the various screens and it was just really cool because during the actual the conference proper we just had the screens like amplifying people's faces and stuff like that and it was really cool to see it used and kind of got me excited for bitcoin 2023 for what we might be able to do in terms of the the Bitcoin content as well. Also, the the giant robots shooting uh, liquid nitrogen that was pretty cool too. That was sweet. Uh, I went to more of the comedy stuff, so I got to see like Jay Farrow. I got to see Mike Rappaport. Got to see uh, yeah, just a bunch of people doing more of the comedy stuff. That's kind of more of my scene than the concert festival. Uh, although I did see Logic. The tail end of his set was awesome. San Holo was very good. So, but there was a lot to do. A lot for everyone. Yeah, I will. Like I loved going to see Hannibal Burris. Like it was a little weird and janky, but like it's Hannibal's vibe when he performs. But <laughs> apparently, like McShane and I missed like all of the stuff after Logic set. Like I pretty I saw David Bailey and TK get caked, and I heard David Bailey's speech, and then that was it. So my bad on that, but I am happy I did see Hannibal. I thought Marshmallow. No, not Marshmallow. Um, Steve Aoki was dope. I did not realize caking people was his thing, though. I've never seen him before live. And, like, that was interesting to me. Just seeing a grown man get cake after cake and just chuck them into a crowd. And people wanted this. Yeah, that was weird. But, hey, like, good, good for, I'm stoked for the people who wanted to get cake and got cake. Like, good. I hope you had an awesome time. Yeah. I would have been so angry if I was like in the crowd and got caked though. I would have been furious. Yeah. Yeah. I also, there were some funny moments where like he went to throw the cake and it like slid off the platter and just like hit somebody in the side of the neck. And they were like, yeah, I just got caked in the neck. It was very weird. I was like, I'm an old man. Old man yells right. Bitcoin. I think it's just a, a gentle reminder. I'm just pulling up right now the exact price on. Cash app is $28,398.16 as of this moment. So be free. Oh, yeah, it's also right there behind P. Probably, probably could have just done that. But smash them by, stack some stats. They're cheaper than ever. 
could go down, could go up, who knows, but right now is a great opportunity to stack them stats. Uh, P, Chris, any final thoughts? No, I, I, I got one final thought and then I'll let P go. I think uh, P is going to mess with us and unplug that block clock at a, at a certain price and like pull an Odell of like Odell unplugged it at 58K. So a lot of people are like, wait, it's at 50. Like they're like panic when he's in meetings and they like pull up their phone real quick. But I definitely think I could see him messing with us and unplugging it, leaving it at a price. I love that idea. Yeah. As an e-ink display, uh, of course it will just stay whatever you, whatever the last power state that it was. So I love that idea. Um, I think that, you know, in these moments where everybody's really focused on price, right. Even, uh, I certainly am. I'm like, oh man, my net worth. But at the end of the day, it's very important to focus on like why we're actually in Bitcoin, that it is freedom money. Right. And (laughs) Q is cackling madly. Uh, I just saw Joe Rogers' tweet that I will read out loud to you guys. That's perfect. Oh, hit it, hit it. You said you won't or you will? No, I will, I will. Oh. I didn't want to interrupt you though. Uh, oh, well, I was just gonna say like the importance of like remembering like why we're actually here, right? Uh, Bitcoin represents this pristine asset. Uh, it represents freedom from central bank apartheid. And don't be someone who... Uh, as hard as it is, and I remind this, I scream this at myself in the mirror every day, like the price is less meaningful than the fact that this allows us to build this new culture, this new ecosystem, this new community that is centered around actual value. And that to me is the thing that's the most important. So focus on that. Uh, All the best stuff happens during the bear markets. All the best technologies are built. All the best friendships are made. The signal goes up astronomically and the noise decreases. Uh, Take this opportunity while the price is low to really cement your friendships, your to learn more and to embrace what Bitcoin is actually about. That's all I got. I love that. Now, uh, this is, I think, my moment where I'm going to announce that I'm stepping away from Bitcoin. I'm going to go into full-time shit coinery. I'm going God to get a stable coin that is backed by two things and two things only. The price of a Costco hot dog and an Arizona iced tea. Oh, yeah. Solid play. Solid play. Those are better stable coins than most things. So right, like that—that that was the tweet. It didn't have the Arizona iced tea part. I added that, but I was like, honestly, like those are legitimate stores of value compared to everything else that has u- been used as a store of value up until this point. So well, how, how many wait, Costco hot dogs to get you a you know a Honda Civic Si or whatever? Like oh, 20,000 hot dogs raining down on this. No, no, but here's the problem: it's not a store of value. Right, yeah. because it's pegged to the U.S. dollar. So what's actually happening is, as you are bought, like one hot dog from 2008 is not the same value as one hot dog now. You actually want the opposite. You want something that's going to increase in value as the or increase in nominal fiat terms as the number of U.S. dollars that are printed. So if you try to store your money in in, uh, you know. Costco hot dogs, you would be utterly fucked right now. My mind was just blown. Like, Q is is possible. The government wants to store your value in hot dogs, is what I'm trying to tell you. (laughs) Don't do what the government I'm just saying the moldy hot dog that's in my freezer right now is worth more than when I bought it 20 years ago. But that's my two cents or two sats. Got to break free of that fiat mindset, my friend. Even your language, even they got, they, they're in your head. Fucking Jerome Powell's <laughs> living in your head rent free. You don't even realize it, bro. Honestly, I'm going to go shit coin and I'm going to go eat a couple of Costco hot dogs after this conversation. So do it, do it. Most necessary. Chris, final word. Uh, I'm all good. Stack sats. Stay humble. Bye. Peace.